I was out for my afternoon jog and decided to take a new route. Suddenly, I saw a huge European-style mansion and had to stop to gaze at it. The walls were covered in moss, and honestly, it looked pretty eerie. I looked up, and a flock of crows were standing on the roof cawing. It sent shivers up my spine, and immediately made me think of movies like The Conjuring or something. Wouldn't be surprised if that house was haunted. Suddenly, I got startled by the voice of an old lady. The mansion looks magnificent, doesn't it? I turned to look at her, and she continued. But you'd better stay away from it. Why? I asked her. Then she looked at me more closely and said, Oh, you aren't a local here, are you? I told her I was from Minnesota, but that my parents had said I could spend the summer here with my aunt. Well, dear, let me tell you. The owner of this mansion was a young girl, super rich, but kept herself to herself. Rumor has it, she worshipped Satan. Can you believe it? I asked her, so where is she now? Oh, she mysteriously disappeared years ago, and the house has been abandoned ever since, the lady replied. Okay, this was seriously freaky. My hair was literally standing on end. But for some reason, I was more intrigued than ever. Oh, sorry, I should have introduced myself. I'm Ellie, a typical high school student, but also an avid detective story blogger. I spend a lot of my time on detective story forums and have always been attracted to weird and mysterious things ever since I was a little kid. Anyway, back to my story. So, one night, my aunt asked me to pop over to the grocery store to get some milk. On my way back, I passed the mansion and instantly got shivers. I looked up and saw a light flickering in a window on the second floor, like a candle or something. But no way. The old lady said the place was abandoned, right? The light kept flickering, and I couldn't stop watching. Suddenly, a shadow of a girl appeared. She was playing the violin, and the gloomy music was wafting through the cracks in the walls. Then, out of nowhere, a crow flew by screaming, Gah! I almost leapt out of my skin and ran straight home. How could anyone live in that freaky mansion? Wait a minute, what if I'd just seen the ghost of the owner who disappeared? Oh man, I had to figure this mystery out. I could even turn it into a detective story with a bit of horror thrown in for fun. As I lay there, I came up with the title, Real Life Death Mansion. And then I realized I could even make a YouTube video about it with real photos of the house and maybe even some footage taken inside as I uncover the mystery. Oh, this would be so good! I could barely sleep from excitement, and the next day, I asked my cousin Susan to come along and explore the mansion with me. Hey Susan, want to come check out that creepy mansion with me? OMG, Ellie, are you crazy? You know that place is haunted, right? Like, full of ghosts and everything. Yeah... That's why I asked you to go with me. I shrugged. I would rather make a detour than walk past that house to get home. So what makes you think I would dare to go inside? I tried to convince her it would be fun, but she kept refusing. Oh well. If no one dared to go into that mansion, then I shall be the first. Gathering up my courage, I went there alone. I managed to climb over the rusty iron fence that had almost fallen to pieces in the backyard. Then I noticed a door that was slightly ajar. As I got closer, I realized a satanic symbol was engraved on the door. Creepy! I closed my eyes, held my breath, and gently pushed the door open. The smell that hit me made me feel dizzy. A musty, abandoned kind of smell. I walked into the lounge, and it felt like I just walked into some old castle in France or something. There were cobwebs everywhere, and some massive ones hanging from the chandeliers. I looked around and noticed a portrait of a girl on the wall. She was beautiful, but her eyes looked so sad. Oh my, was this the owner? 
the one I'd seen playing the violin? I couldn't bear to look at the portrait any longer. It felt like her eyes were piercing my soul. I headed for the stairs and crept up as quietly as possible. I won't lie, I was terrified. It was so dark up there, and with every step I took, the floorboards creaked. I kept looking behind me, as it sounded like someone was following me. By this point, I'd broken out into a cold sweat. When I made it to the second floor, there was a long corridor ahead, but it was really weird. There was only one door. I walked towards it and pushed it open. It was a luxury room, definitely fit for a princess. And yep, there was the violin. Everything was coated in a thick layer of dust, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a picture. It was the same girl, but this time, her eyes were glowing red like fire, just like Sauron, the villain in The Lord of the Rings. I was so scared that I quickly turned the photo face down. This was when I heard the violin sound from somewhere. Okay, what was going on? The violin was right before my eyes, and I was supposed to be the only one in the house? I tried to calm down, took a deep breath, and walked in the direction of the sound next door. It was so weird, because the next door was an exact replica of the first room. Had I actually changed rooms? I walked towards the dressing table and noticed the photo in here was also turned face down. I picked it up, and it was the exact same photo, but this time, the face of the girl was bleached white. I dropped the photo in horror and ran off without looking back. I ran down the stairs three at a time, but when I reached the door, it was locked. I started banging on it, and by then I was hysterically crying. Help! Help me! I screamed. Suddenly, someone's hand touched my shoulder. My heart had definitely jumped out of my chest. Uh, ah! I yelled at the top of my lungs, but when I turned around, there was this young guy standing there. A pretty cute one. Who, who are you? I stuttered. He frowned at me and said, Who are you? And why are you here? I, I... I could barely speak as I was shaking so much. Then the guy said, Come on, let's get out of here. You look horrified. Then he took out a key and opened the door. Are... are you a ghost or something? I stuttered. He started laughing and said, Pretty creepy place, right? I asked him if he saw the photos too, and he said, Yes, terrifying. Like something out of a horror movie, I added. Exactly. Perfect setting for a horror movie. I stared in confusion, and he laughed and said, Yup, we're making a movie. I mean, I'm gonna rent this place to make a horror movie. Then he introduced himself as Jack, a young director who was interested in detective and horror movies. He was just checking the place out to see if it was suitable. I couldn't believe it. Wow, this is literally a dream come true. I've been writing detective stories since I could hold a pen and I've always hoped I'd become a screenwriter on horror and detective movies one day. I'm so honored to meet you. I'm Ellie, by the way. Then Jack replied, The pleasure's all mine. It's a pretty exciting industry to be in. I'd love to read some of your stuff sometime. I couldn't stop grinning. Then suddenly, another person showed up. Jack introduced him as Michael, a member of his film crew. But compared to how friendly Jack was, Mike was serious and intimidating. Jack could tell that I was nervous, so he laughed and said, Michael's been under a lot of stress, so he looks a bit grumpy, right? I just smiled shyly and asked Jack if I could have his number. As I walked home, I couldn't believe how happy I felt. Who knew such a scary adventure would turn into an epic opportunity? I texted Jack right away, saying I would love to learn more about his film, and I had to admit, I might have had a slight crush on him. He was so cute. I kept checking my phone, but he hadn't replied. That was so disappointing. But then, a few days later, he asked me out for coffee. I was so excited. And seriously, we had the best time. He even offered to drive me home. When I got into the car, he told me to close my eyes. Beek! Maybe he was going to kiss me. 
I was so nervous, but suddenly something hit my face and I didn't know anything else. When I woke up, I found myself in some kind of warehouse with my hands and feet tied and my mouth taped shut. Oh my god, had I been kidnapped? Where was Jack? Suddenly, I heard a noise outside. I looked through the window and saw Jack and Michael talking to each other. What? Did the two of them plan this? But why? A moment later, Michael left, and Jack came towards me and removed the tape from my mouth. I started screaming. Why are you doing this to me? Then Jack said, Listen, I'm not going to hurt you, I swear, but there's something I need to tell you. Then he confessed that he was a member of a criminal organization named Iron Gloves. His gang were operating from the mansion, and so everything from the story of the mysterious missing girl, the ghost playing the violin, the eerie photos, were all made up by them. They did it so that no one would dare approach their headquarters. According to the gang's rules, any outsider that entered the mansion would be killed to protect the secrecy of the group. Michael had seen me enter and reported it to the boss, so Jack had been forced to carry out the mission, but he didn't want to do it, so that's why he pretended to kidnap me. Dear good God, this was too much! He asked me to leave right away, but I was worried about him. He said, don't worry, I've been wanting to leave for a long time, and so I have a plan. Fast forward two years. And now, I'm a freshman majoring in screenwriting. It's so exciting chasing my passion, but I still think that summer at my aunt's was one of my best yet. Terrifying, but thrilling. Oh, and as for Jack, after we chatted in the warehouse, he let me go, and I quickly packed up all my stuff at my aunt's and flew home. A few weeks later, I saw an article that said he'd turned himself in, and that the police had caught the Iron Gloves gang. Now, Jack's in prison, but will soon be free. I have a feeling that deep down, he's a good guy, and I hope that I'll have the chance to meet him again and get to know the real him better. Who knows? His real-life experience might help me write one hell of an awesome story, too. So, here I am, practicing this tricky pose. I must not fall over. Rosie, straighten your back. Hang in there. You've got this. That's Bradley, my yoga instructor. Can you see that? There are more than a dozen people in this class, yet he only seems to encourage me. Did this mean he liked me? I didn't need to look in a mirror to know my cheeks were lobster red right now. I'm Rosie, by the way, 18 years old. I'm still single. Not to brag, but I know I'm kind of pretty, friendly, and fun to be around, so it's easy to tell that many guys are into me. But why do none of them ever dare to confess their feelings to me? Hmm, what were they so afraid of? Take Bradley, for instance. He clearly liked me, but was too shy to admit it. It was so obvious, as he kept deterring past my mat just so he could check out my position. Even my best friend Joseph noticed that. As every time Bradley approached, Joseph would have this cheeky smirk on and send me signals with his eyes. I already told him not to do that. After class, Joseph kept teasing me about it. He told me Bradley definitely had feelings for me and just needed one more push for leverage. Although I reluctantly told him to stop, he insisted on being the wingman by texting Bradley about me. Bradley, why don't you ask Rosie out? You two look really cute together. Come on, you know that wouldn't work. Huh? <laughs> Why not? Because, Joseph, it's you I'm crazy about. I was not okay. What was the problem with all the men around me? Why didn't they like me? I couldn't go on like this. I must have a boyfriend. And I was dead serious about it. So after researching online, I found a dating coach to save me from my tragic single situation. So Martin, my coach, is super handsome has a six-pack, and his business is a big hit. He's helped hundreds of sad single people find love. Flashy enough to trust, isn't it? Still, I was quite nervous when I met him. You know, the feeling that a therapist would judge you before treating you. But actually, he was reassuring, very open, and didn't ask too many questions. 
Let's just be open about this, all right? Manipulating someone into dating you is not the foundation to a healthy relationship. But don't worry, as I have the secret. Day one. And according to Martin, I needed to learn how to approach new people. I'm pretty shy, so taking the initiative was hard for me. But Martin taught me a trick. When I see a cute guy, I need to approach him within three seconds. This way my brain wouldn't have time to think, analyze, then talk myself out of it, and end up missing my chance. Okay, a hot guy was there staring at his phone. I must not overthink. One, two, three, go. Hi. Hi. Um, so I just saw you and I think you're really hot. I'm here to say hi. Thanks for thinking my boyfriend's hot, but he's taken. I panicked, then rushed back to Martin and spluttered out, I, I, I can't. Hey, that was a success. You're just training your mind and body to take action. Go ahead. No way. Should we move to the next step? And this was the next step. I just needed to start a conversation in this place where everyone was in a mood to have a chat. It's simple, Rosie. Put yourself in a talkative mood. Go over to them and give them a compliment. But make sure it's genuine, else it won't count, okay? Got it. I spotted a man sitting alone, so I walked over to him. Hey, I like your... ring. Oh, um, gee, was that a wedding ring? <laughs> don't, don't worry. I'm single. And is it that hard to think of something to compliment me on? <laughs> and, um, you are smarter than you look. And yep, he left. Oh, what kind of compliment was that? Martin sat in a corner and watched me go from guy to guy and stutter out a string of terrible compliments. You did great, Rosie. Don't be discouraged. Now, when you actually see someone you like, you'll be more natural. Martin said that body language is a crucial part of keeping the conversation going. So, the plan was to practice this at Joseph's birthday party. This time Martin couldn't be there in person, but we still stayed in touch via my Bluetooth earphone so he could guide me. The mission today was to initiate physical contact with someone and make them feel close to me. Anyone who knows me knows that I am not good with these things. So I kept giving them this weird slap on the back. Hey, I heard an ouch. Are you hitting them? I said just a light tap. I don't think I can do this. I'm too shy. And now guys are giving me weird looks. Martin said this time I should make the boys take the initiative, and then things would come more naturally. Okay. I'll give it one last try. This boy I like, Nathan, is over by the pool, but he's in a group. Nothing to worry about. You'll make him come to you. Now listen and follow. I walked over to the bar and made sure I was in Nathan's eyesight, sat as naturally as possible, made eye contact with him, and smiled. Oh, Martin, this is stupid. He doesn't even know me. Just wait. OMG. He's waving at me. Should I come now? No, no, no. Wave him over. Okay. You should take responsibility for this, Martin. I waved Nathan over. Then, to my surprise, he got up and started walking toward me. OMG, help! What should I do? Give a no-tooth smile. Then say, I just want to say hi. What? That was all? But he was coming closer and I had no choice. I just want to say hi. And I want to have your phone number, cutie. I couldn't believe it. That was a real success. We texted the whole night. We got on so well. He was clearly flirting with me. This is crazy. But then two weeks passed by and I didn't hear from him at all. I kept on looking at my phone expecting Nathan to call, but he never did. So I immediately rang my coach for help. Ready for the bad news? So that means he doesn't like you. A busy man like Napoleon could still write thousands of romantic love letters to his Josephine. If he was into you, he'd always find a way. And I also think he doesn't seem like a good type to date. What? Nathan is such a sweet guy. Maybe he's just super busy? But then Christmas came, and I couldn't wait any longer. I mustered up the courage to ask Nathan out. But guess what? He invited me to his house to enjoy Christmas with his family instead. Oh, wow. He wanted to introduce me to his family. This was massive. It meant he really took our relationship seriously, didn't he? But when we got to Nathan's place, to my surprise, it was just a small apartment and definitely not big enough for a whole family. 
Seeing my confused look, Nathan said his family must have changed their plans and went out, which was for the better as the two of us would have more time together. Suddenly, I saw a shadow of a girl in a red dress in his bedroom. The Nathan immediately pulled me away and said, Uh, um, that's my maid. How annoying. So, do you want to go to the hotel so we can have more time alone? Really? Did he think I was born yesterday? I refused immediately, and Nathan began to change his attitude. <laughs> okay, but I can't drive you home. I have something urgent. But don't worry, I'll take you to the nearby bus stop. I have never felt so stupid. Martin was right. Nathan wasn't serious about me. He just wanted to use me. But what went wrong? I did everything I could, but I kept failing again and again. No one liked me. I called Martin in tears, and he ended up driving there to pick me up right on Christmas Eve. I felt like the most tragic person ever. Martin was so patient. He turned the radio on so loud and didn't say anything until I finished crying and calmed down. Misread the signals again, huh? How could I have known? Well, I'm not saying this to make money off you, but looking at the current situation, I think you need to hire me for longer than you think. My love life may have sucked, but at least I had Martin. Here's my hope. He was the best coach ever, as he didn't mind answering my questions, and he always picked up the phone whether it was office hours or midnight. Then one night I was out with my friends. I drank a few too many wines and phoned Martin up and slurred out a load of drunken nonsense. He immediately came to pick me up and drove me home, saying that he needed to make sure I got home safely. He was such a sweet guy. I felt something, but then reassured myself that he was just being nice. But Joseph insisted that Martin was only acting this way because he liked me. Seeing everything he did, and you still have to wonder about his feelings? Dummy. Believe me, I'm not wrong this time. Mr. Sixpack is crazy about you. Congrats. Hmm. Thinking about it, it did make sense. So I started stalking my coach on social media and daydreaming about him. Then, taking Martin's own advice that I needed to make my feelings known. So, on Valentine's night, I, myself, made this box of chocolates and took them round to his. I took a deep breath, then rang the doorbell. But then, standing at the door was him holding hands with another girl. I awkwardly said, Don't, don't you like me? I mean, you taught me that when a guy likes a girl... He'll always be there for her. You picked me up in the middle of the night, and you always listened and comforted me when I was sad. You even brought me hot tea when my Aunt Flo came to visit. Doesn't everything match up? R Rosie, I was just being nice. Sorry, but you've confused the signs. Again. I was totally dumbfounded. I couldn't face the thought of seeing Martin ever again, so I blocked him from my life. Ugh. In the following days... I was under a variety of emotional states, from extreme stress, heartbreak, embarrassment, then disappointment because of my extra delusion. I struggled with insomnia almost every night and tried to bury my feelings by binge-eating junk food. Just two weeks later, I looked at myself in the mirror. There were dark circles under my eyes, my skin was dry and flaky, and I felt bloated and sluggish most of the time. Seeing myself like that reminded me of something Martin had said. How can you expect someone else to love you if you don't love yourself? I knew I needed to change, so I started eating more healthily, working out, and finding me time. And you know what? It worked. Now I can finally say that I see my own worth, and I'll never allow a man to treat me badly ever again. And if that means I stay single for a while, then that's the way it'll be. I guess I kinda owe Martin a lot. I mean, he did teach me loads. And now, even though I'm still single... I'm enjoying it. There are way more important things than having a boyfriend, right? But wait, was this barista winking at me? OMG, there's a post-it with his number on my coffee cup. What should I do? Hey, dating a coffee guy is risky business. Why, coach? Imagine one day your relationship turns bad and you desire a cup of coffee to ease your heart out, but you also have to see him here. Awkward, huh? Indeed a pro. But so why are you making this awkward convo? <laughs> Rosie, I may be a love coach, but even I get it wrong sometimes. When it comes to my heart, 
all theories are nonsense. Please, you show me how to love naturally. Um, well, as you can see, I'm dating my dating coach. But now, our love doesn't apply to any cliches. Instead, we just do us, and we're both happier than ever. If you're in a dating slump, then don't worry. Just let love happen when it happens, and follow your heart. Hi, I'm Stella, and I had a boyfriend called Cole. Emphasis on the had. You see, I really liked Cole, but he expected me to do everything for him, but he didn't show me the same respect. I always put him first. One time, I bailed on my friends to see him. Then he canceled on me last minute to watch a baseball match with his brother. But I was mad, so I ended up venting out my problems to one of my guy friends. Then I kissed him. I instantly regretted it. Cole found out, and he broke up with me. Then, the next day, he started dating this annoying sophomore girl. Like, seriously, couldn't he stick to a girl his own age, as he was a senior? How dare Cole break up with me? Yes, I made a mistake, but only because he let me down. I'd made one lame mistake, but other than that, I tried my hardest to be an awesome girlfriend to him. He was clearly waiting for me to mess up so he could break up with me for her. The anger toward Cole was eating me up. Revenging him was all I could think about. One day at lunch, my best friend Sophia's boyfriend Branson told me about this spiritualist his mom saw. Apparently, she cast a spell to help her get over her boyfriend leaving her. I wasn't really into the spiritual stuff and such, but I guessed it was worth a try. So after school, Branson took me to see her. She lived up in this creepy alley. It was eerily quiet. Yet, it felt like I was being watched. I gave him this you-must-be-kidding look, but he grabbed my arm and pulled me forward. A middle-aged woman answered the door. Her dark hair was so long, it almost reached her hips, and she was wearing this flowy dress. I'm still... I started. Yes, I know. She waved me forward. Come in, come in. Branson waited outside, and I gave him a this-is-weird look before I followed this woman inside. She led me into a small room full of crystals, glass balls, and jars full of different things such as spices, colored ribbons, and flowers. So, you, um, make spells? I asked her. Yes, I do. She smiled at me. But beware. Magic is a powerful thing that doesn't always work the way intended. Um, I want a spell to make my ex Cole break up with his girlfriend and want me back. She asked for my hair. I mean, just a single hair, not all of it. I pulled out three strands of my hair and gave it to her feeling so confused. Then she asked for Cole's stuff. I shook my head tentatively. Then I remembered that I had one of his earphones in my backpack. This must be really serious. She asked me again if I was sure, and I gave a nod of my head. Like, seriously, didn't this woman want to make money? Then she used my hair to wrap around and around Cole's earphone, then closed her eyes and began chanting words that I couldn't quite make out. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. What was going on? I was so relieved to leave her house, and I told Branson to never ever give me any of his bright ideas again. Now I was down $100 and had been totally freaked out. Over the next few days, I didn't give the spell much thought. I got over Cole and what he did to me. Things were good, but then something crazy happened. At 9 p.m. on a rainy Friday night, there was a knock at my door. My parents were out, so I answered it. Cole was standing on my doorstep, a soggy mess. He actually got down on his knees and begged me to take him back. It was crazy. I told him to go away and slammed the door shut on him. He continued to knock and shouted that he loved me and wanted me back. He'd ended things with his girlfriend as she didn't own his heart. I did. Okay, it was weird. This guy may have looked like Cole, but he certainly wasn't acting like him. He eventually left, but the next morning, he was back again, sobbing out how he couldn't live without me in his life. 
He didn't seem normal. He was out of his mind. It got so bad that my dad threatened to call the police unless he left right away. Eventually, he did leave. But on Monday morning, he was waiting for me by my locker with a cuddly bear and a box of chocolates. The other kids were laughing as they walked past, and I found myself laughing too. Go away, Cole. I don't like you, and I never will. You're a loser, I told him. He looked like he was going to cry. I have to admit that seeing him this distressed felt good. But a week later, his weird behavior continued. He was still following me around and buying me gifts. This had gone too far, and I needed to do something about it. So I opened up to Branson about it. He told me not to worry and said he'd visit the spiritualist and get her to undo the spell. I guess it worked, as Cole finally seemed to get the message and his behavior mellowed down. But then something weird began to happen to me. I had a dream about getting with Branson, and now I can't stop thinking about him. On a few occasions, I've walked over to his house at night in a trance-like state. It's taken all my will not to knock on his door. Seeing Sophia all loved up with him makes me want to puke. I never had feelings for Branson before. What if he cast a spell on me to make me fall for him? I went back to the old alley to find the spiritualist woman, but I couldn't find the house. It's like the house and the spiritualist woman have never existed. Okay, so something else weird happened too. I was in the park one day and I was sure I saw Branson talking to Cole. They looked really chatty. They weren't friends, so what was going on? I can't go straight to my best friend's boyfriend to ask shameful questions like, did you put a love spell on me? Or did you set up this whole thing with Cole to make me fall for you? I don't know what's going on. All I know is, as ridiculous as this may sound, I have this desire to be around Branson all the time. I've had crushes on boys before, but never like this. I don't know what's happening or what I should do next. Hey, my name's Camilla. So, there's something bad I did. I'm now super ashamed of it. Anyway, I'm a different person now, and I'm telling you guys this so you hopefully won't make the same mistake I did. I was the popular girl in high school, along with my best friend, Lisa. Both of us were pretty well-liked, but the other kids seemed to like me more than her. I guess she knew this, and it meant we low-key competed against each other on everything, from wearing the cutest outfits to getting the hottest boy's attention. I suppose it kind of made us frenemies. So prom was only a few weeks away, and I had the prom queen crown in my reach. But then I heard a few lame rumors circulating about me such as how I'd kissed Rita Stone's boyfriend behind the bike shed, and how I'd been the one writing the really mean comments about the other girl on the bathroom cubicle wall. I tried to shrug these ridiculous rumors off, but it seemed like everyone else believed them. Worse still, I had this inkling that Lisa, who was sickeningly sweet to my face, had something to do with the rumors. After all, I know how eager she was to be prom queen. Things went on for a few days. Everyone whispered and pointed at me as I walked by. I was so mad, especially as Lisa continued enjoying life and pretending to pity me. I'd had enough. So that day during lunch break, I stomped straight towards her in the cafeteria. We had a huge fight, yelled at each other. I then threw my carton of milk at her, then carried my lunchbox to another table in the corner. I was sitting there alone, crying, when someone tapped on my shoulder. It was Aubrey asking me to join her table. Aubrey and I go way back, as she was my old childhood friend. But ever since middle school, she's a bit of a loser, so I hadn't spoken to her in a while. I agreed, and followed her to another table in tears. Her group of friends are a bunch of nerds, and I've probably teased some of them before. Awkward. As I sat down, I noticed this one guy, Scott, who was also kinda out of place. He's too good looking for this table. He made hanging out with the losers so much easier. As we all were chatting, I've already thought about how me and Scott would make such a cute couple, and we could rule this group. Of course, I was still so mad with Lisa, so I came up with a plan to get my revenge. 
I asked the nerd crew of Aubrey to help me ruin the prom. If I couldn't be prom queen, then I wanted to destroy it so Lisa couldn't have it either. I convinced them by going on and on about how they should stand up for themselves and defeat the popular mean girl. Lisa, as her latest victim, I guess I've delivered a pretty inspirational speech that got them all hyped up to join me. The nerd crew's smart, so it'd be easy for them to mess up the electrical system at prom, switch the music playlist to something funny, ruin the drinks, pour down a bucket of water on the winners as they announce prom king and queen on stage. While preparing for the big day, I hung out with them more and more, and I'm not gonna lie, it was pretty fun, and I kinda liked them. They didn't do the whole fake friendship thing like I'd had to endure with Lisa, and it made life so much easier. Along with my revenge plan, I also had another operation going. Scott. Remember? I decided to make a move and flirt with him every time we met. I saw Aubrey secretly peek at him from time to time, so I once jokingly asked her if she liked him, and she blushed and blurted out a tiny, yes. Poor Aubrey, as he was way out of her league. One day, I asked Scott to accompany me to go buy some stuff for our prank. While we were in the car, I asked him why he joined the group, as they're all losers. And he said it's actually because he liked Aubrey, so hanging out with this group meant he could spend more time with her. Plus, the others were actually fun too. I got a little mad that he actually liked her, so I told him, such a pity, but you're not Aubrey's type, as she's into girls. I reached across and touched his arm, and then told him that if we dated, we'd be the hottest couple. I'd be the most popular girl again, and he too would have the fame he deserved. Forget those nerds, as they were dragging us both down. He stayed calm and told me to stop, but I kept flirting with him until he dropped me off at my house. Finally, the big day came, and I arrived late to prom because I only wanted to see the grand finale of Lisa being soaked on stage. As I walked into the venue, I expected it to be a mess. Flickering lights, lame music, and people complaining about the drinks but everything looked fine. I didn't get it, so I found one of the nerds and asked them how the plan's going, but he just shrugged and danced away. I was a bit furious, but then it was prom queen announcing time, which, unsurprisingly, Lisa won. I excitedly waited for the humiliating water shower to follow, but it didn't happen. What was going on? We'd had our group meeting yesterday to make sure everything was ready. I was so mad. I screamed at a guy from the nerd group, and he said maybe I should check it myself. I then got on stage to check when everyone was starting to leave. But then, as I looked up, the water bucket fell on me! I screamed so loud, everyone froze and turned around looking at me. I stood there soaked and humiliated in front of the entire school! Then, out of nowhere, the whole group of nerds, including Aubrey, gathered in front of me and said that I deserved this. It turned out, Aubrey and Scott have been dating for a while now, and he had told her everything I'd said. Aubrey said she'd given me a second chance to be in her life again, and I hadn't changed at all, and that I was still the same selfish girl. Now, I'm in college, and these days, I'm a much nicer person. It was all in the past. I've apologized to Aubrey, but I am still ashamed when I think about it. I hope you learn a lesson from my mistake and don't mess up like I did. Being popular is great and all, but I now know that some things are far more important. Hey, I'm Amy. I'm 23, and I've been besties with my neighbor Drew for years. But I've never thought of sabotaging his wedding, ever! Heck, I thought I'd be the one marrying him. Well, I mean, if no one better came along, Drew's two years older than me. But back then, I wasn't your regular girly girl. Instead, I much preferred hanging out with the boys and playing basketball, so we quickly became best friends. But when I hit puberty, how I looked began to matter more to me, so I started making efforts and behaved more like a lady, result being that guys started noticing me, Drew included. 
One time back in high school, Drew asked me out, but I just laughed it off and told him to stop kidding. In other words, I rejected him. It was good to know that I had him as a backup, but right then and there, I didn't want to date him. Why would I, when I could have any boy in the school? After that, he pretty much did anything I asked, treated me like a princess, and followed me everywhere I went. Heck, we were so close that it was an in-joke with my family that we would end up together. When I went to study in Europe for three years, Drew was still there for me when I went through tough times, or even breakups. Being in a different country meant that Drew and I didn't talk as much as we used to, but I knew that if I needed him, then all I needed to do was click my fingers and he'd appear. Whenever I came back home for the holidays, he was always there at the airport waiting to pick me up. So when I finished my studies and arrived home for good, I expected him to be there to pick me up with a large bunch of flowers in hand. But no, he didn't show up. It was only my parents waiting for me. On the journey home, I sat there sulking. Drew had majorly annoyed me. How dare he stand me up? Sensing my mood, Mom asked, Sweetie, what's up? Aren't you happy to be back? I muttered out, Yeah, I just don't appreciate Drew not picking me up. Mom casually said, Oh, right. Although, I suppose planning the wedding is keeping him busy. I'm sure he just forgot. I sat upright in my seat. What? Wedding? Whose wedding? My mom then acted surprised. He didn't tell you? Oh, how busy the groom-to-be must be. <laughs> Honey, it's Drew's wedding. This uneasy feeling washed over me. I felt like I'd been cheated on. Okay, so I didn't love him. But that's not the point. How dare some girl come along and steal him away from me? I arrived home to see Drew pacing the curb. He spotted me and gave me an excited wave. I stormed over to him and shouted out, Why didn't you tell me you're getting married? He smiled and then replied, I'm sorry, Amy. I just wanted to do it in person as I have an important question to ask you. He sounded so serious. Then he reached into his pocket. OMG, was he going to propose to me? Has this all been a prank leading to this moment? But no, he pulled out a packet of mints and offered me one. At that moment, a girl walked out of his house and passed him a coffee. He wrapped his arms around her waist and kissed the top of her head. Yuck! Amy, you remember Emily, right? She was in your year at school. She's my fiancé. We'd like to ask you to be our bridesmaid. Emily added, Actually, he wanted you to be his best man, since we all know how close you guys are, but that would look a little strange, don't you think? I just stood there speechless with my mouth wide open. No, I didn't remember this Emily girl from school, and I didn't want to be her stupid bridesmaid. Drew joked, Aren't you happy for me? I know you'll love this. That's why I waited till now to tell you, to be able to see your over-the-top reaction. <laughs> I had no reaction. I literally couldn't find any words to say and just stood there motionless as the realization that the guy I could always count on was now someone else's, and I was meant to help them out with their lame wedding. I tried being happy for them, but they just made me feel so sick. Now whenever I wanted to see Drew, there's Emily tagging along, and they always talk to each other in this annoying high-pitched voice, not to mention the kissing and hugging every five seconds. I couldn't stand seeing their PDA for another moment, so I decided to pull some mischievous pranks. First, I kept asking Emily to eat fast foods with me, which I told her that I extremely craved for since I'd been abroad for so long. But the real reason was just that I wanted her to gain weight quickly and be unable to fit into her wedding dress. And I succeeded. When the three of us visited the wedding shop, whichever dress that Emily liked to try, she couldn't fit in. So the only one that fitted her looked very old-fashioned and ugly. Seeing her sulky face, I was so happy inside. Until Drew ran towards her and comforted her, he praised her as the most beautiful woman in the world, no matter what she wore. And he was very lucky to marry her. Ugh. I want to puke for real. A few days later, Emily held her bachelorette party. As the party venue was close to my house, Emily and her friends decided to come over to prepare themselves before the party. Though I found it bothersome at first, then I realized that it's a good opportunity for another prank. That afternoon, when they were all busy putting on makeup and getting dressed, I offered to help Emily iron her dress as I was ironing mine. She agreed and handed me the dress. I secretly turned up the iron's temperature and it burnt her silk dress in a blink. 
I screamed and acted like it was an accident. Emily and her friends immediately rushed over. They were shocked to see the dress was totally ruined. I apologized frantically as tears started to well up in Emily's eyes. Are you sure you didn't do it on purpose? A friend of Emily asked me. Then everyone gave me a dirty look. No, don't say that. Amy's just trying to help me, Emily said through tears. Jeez, why did she have to be so nice? After that, she called Drew, cried desperately, and told him everything. And just half an hour later, Drew showed up and handed Emily a brand new dress, which is even prettier than the old one. Emily hugged Drew, kissed him on the cheek, and went on and on about how he's the best. Yuck. Suddenly, some of Emily's friends whispered something like, Emily is so lucky to have a fiancé like Drew. Unlike Carl, he is really useless. So Carl was Emily's ex, right? I wondered if he also wanted to break this wedding like me. So I did some digging online and easily found Carl. Then I messaged him, telling him I was Emily's bridesmaid and I had something super urgent to tell him about her. He agreed to meet me at a bar downtown. First impression? This guy's actually kinda cute. Turns out, goody two-shoes Emily has good taste in guys. As I sat down next to him, I noticed that Carl had been drinking a lot. But... I didn't think much of it at the time. I gave my best convincing look and told him, Emily still has feelings for you. She's now having cold feet about the wedding. At first, he didn't say much. He just kept on drinking. But suddenly, he stood up and slurred out how he needed to confess his love to her. Right now! So I followed him to her house. That night, the bridesmaids were having a sleepover at Emily's to help her prepare the guest list for the wedding and stuff. I quickly came in and made up some excuse for showing up late. And that's when we all heard something noisy coming from outside. Everyone ran to the porch to check out Carl begin to drunkenly slur out something like, I will always love you and such. Emily looked shocked and tried persuading Carl to go home. I watched on with a secret smirk as he threw up in her pot plant, accused the other bridesmaids of being traitors, and tripped over the cat as he tried to enter her house. Carl eventually passed out on the couch, and Emily, being Emily, placed a blanket over him. She didn't even look angry. Why? I couldn't understand why I had done so many things, but she could be so calm and overcame everything. The next day, when Carl woke up, they talked, and I was terrified Carl would tell Emily about my involvement. But instead, he apologized to her, wished her the best for the future, then left. A few days later, Carl asked me to meet him at a coffee shop. He asked me why I lied to him, as Emily said she was very blissful to marry Drew. I sighed and told him the truth. I also said that I didn't have feelings for Drew, I just hated to see the two of them together. Then Carl said, Don't let jealousy get the best of you. Listen to me, Amy. What we need to do now is restore our life and leave the past behind. I felt down upon hearing his words, but I knew Carl was right. Despite Drew having been my best friend since childhood, it was the moment he needed to have a life of his own. Don't be so sad, Carl said, patting my hand gently. I looked up and was fascinated by not only Carl's look, but also his maturity and sensitivity. The wedding day came. I stood next to Drew and Emily as they exchanged their rings to take a vow to be husband and wife. Somehow, I felt so proud that my best friend found his life partner. But still, I felt a little uneasy inside, until I spotted Carl in the crowd. He walked over, gave me a bright smile, and joked that he was going to spend the rest of the day here so I couldn't cause any more havoc. I laughed out loud and responded, It was more about him than me that would be causing trouble in the wedding. After the ceremony, we spent time together walking through the park and went to an arcade. I have to admit that it was kind of fun and took my mind off things. Since then, something weird happened. I've found myself thinking about Carl a lot. Like, a lot. Am I developing feelings for him? Maybe now is the time for me to find my life partner too. And I think I've found a great candidate. Hey, I'm Jody. I'm a freshman at high school. High school life is hard and stressful, isn't it? But I'm so lucky to be a part of the perfect three with Harmony and Callie. As great as being friends with them is, it can also be challenging, especially as I'm not as life sure as they are. In comparison to them, I felt so boring and dull. But then something crazy happened. All I can say is I never expected boys to ruin our solid relationship.
I wasn't brave with this crazy independent streak like Harmony. Her plan after high school is to go backpacking in Thailand, alone. Callie's strong-minded, quirky, and confident. She is leading a drama club at her school. Yes, she is the kind of person who never thinks twice about clashing colors or wearing three bunches in her hair. I wasn't like them. Instead, I was quiet. My shyness meant that I never told Logan that I had a crush on him. Logan's a genuine boy from school kind of guy. He's handsome, funny, smart, and sporty. Obviously, he would never like a loser like me. So I just had to find a good way to deal with my emotions myself. I sealed my feelings for him away in a love letter. And of course, he was never meant to see it. I tried to avoid Logan as much as I could, but just a month later, I realized that Harmony also likes him. She was not afraid to tell the world and confessed her feelings to him, which was what I would never dare to do. She always gave things up for me and protected me no matter what. So the only thing I could do for her was take a step back. So I wrote my final secret love letter to Logan, saying, From your floppy hair phase to the way you wrinkle up your nose when you sneeze, I've always loved you, Logan. Always. I love you more than Harmony ever has, nor ever will. I don't want you to think I'm a horrible person. I love my friend Harmony, and I want her to be happy. And if that's with Logan, then so be it. I just needed to write him a final love letter to deal with my feelings towards him. But then, I sealed the letter and placed it deep inside my desk drawer to make sure my feelings were safe. Soon, Harmony and Logan started to date. And watching them together made my heart ache. But I'm a quiet girl, so it's not hard to pretend to bless them and hide my true feelings. But something even more disastrous happened. One time, we were on a school camping trip, and Logan was sitting with us in our tent. It was such an awkward moment when Callie was away FaceTiming a guy on her phone, therefore leaving just me there with Logan and Harmony. Talk about feeling like a third wheel! Ages of silence went by, and I had to make an excuse to go out. I couldn't even meet his eyes. Bad idea. It was nothing but dark and cold out there, and I was alone wishing Callie would come back soon. But suddenly, I felt a strong hand grab my arm and pull me back. It was Logan! What was he doing here? Logan? Oh, you're going back to your camping tent? I mumbled. Yeah, Jody, I just don't want to be alone with Harmony. It was so awkward. Oh, you guys are old enough to be in that situation. Don't be shy. I tried to blurt out a random joke and wink at him. No, I like you, and I always have. I just didn't think you liked me. You aren't exactly easy to read. I got your letters. He leaned in to kiss me. For a moment, I thought this was wonderful, but I was disillusioned and quickly pushed him away. I couldn't do that to Harmony. When we came back home the following morning, I rushed to my room to find my drawer empty. Someone found and stole them and sent them to Logan. I couldn't think of anything else. I was too afraid that if Harmony knew about this, our friendship would end. Unfortunately, my rejection wasn't enough to stop Logan. In the following days, he kept on jumping out at me at school, in the canteen, in my living room, and tried to convince me that our feelings weren't wrong. He got so intense that in the end, I blurted out to him that I was dating Robbie, one of my classmates. Luckily, Robbie had recently split up with his girlfriend, so he agreed to be my pretend boyfriend to keep Logan off the scent and to make his ex jealous. Having Robbie on hand was great. He came up with a genius plan for me to tell Logan that the love letters were purely some of many I'd written for my English assignment. And the truth is, Robbie's my real-life boyfriend. Logan didn't believe it until Robbie led me to the basketball match where Logan was playing. It was awkward, as Harmony was there cheering him on, and she seemed oblivious to the fact he wouldn't stop staring at me. When Robbie grabbed my hand and kissed my cheek, Logan missed the basket, and the ball flew into the crowd. Logan quit pestering me after that, but he's still dating Harmony. I feel bad about it, but I'm hoping that Harmony will figure out for herself what Logan's actually like. If I tell her the truth, I worry she'll take his side, not mine, as love has a habit of blurring people's reality. To keep up the act, Robbie posted a picture of us both on his Facebook, and he sent me a relationship request. Although I knew that it was just a move to annoy his ex-girlfriend, I found myself feeling happy about this. The moment after I clicked accept on the request, 
Kelly rushed over to my house and angrily said, How could you do this to me? Robbie's mine. Why do you have to steal both of your best friend's guys? I replied, It's fake. We faked it just to make his ex-girlfriend jealous. And I have no idea you have a crush on him. And what do you mean, both? Don't act like a naive girl. I saw your letters. You're such a dirty fake girl. You don't deserve our friendship or anyone's love. She yelled at me, and I was completely shocked. So, Callie was the one who stole my letters and sent them to Logan. It was my secret to keep, not hers. I was so mad that she could do that to me. So, okay, she found the letters, but she could have spoken to me about them first, not just gone behind my back and sent them to him. She screamed at me that I was a horrible fake friend and that she thought that Logan deserved to know how fake I was in developing feelings for my best friend's boyfriend. She left, and now I'm stuck in a big mess. I never asked for any of this. All I want is a quiet life with my best friends. I don't know how I meant to get out of this situation without both of my friends hating me. You see that sad girl sitting there in a flood of tears? Yeah, I know, she's pretty hard to miss. Well, that was me a few months ago. My boyfriend had literally just broken up with me, and I had to pack my stuff out of his place ASAP with a resentful heart. But thinking back, if he hadn't broken my heart, I wouldn't have fallen into this super awkward and ridiculous situation. Oh, I forgot. I'm Ava. I'm 22, and I suck at love. So anyway, after crying like a newborn, I realized I needed a trip away to free my mind, just like Julia Roberts' character did in the movie Eat, Pray, Love. But I could only afford to do the low-budget version. So I went on Airbnb and found a reasonably priced room to rent in this idyllic beach house. And it gets even better. The owner, Hazel, is out most of the time, so it would be like renting the whole house with the price of one room. Awesome! Reserved! I needed to get out of this emotional hellhole ASAP. As expected, Hazel wasn't home when I arrived, and I had to find the hidden key under a plant pot by the door and let myself in. And, oh my, it was like stepping into a life-size retro dollhouse. From the chic furniture to the funky wallpaper, I loved it here. This Hazel girl has got some taste. Ooh, there was even a record player. If I'd have known, I would have brought my vinyls with me. But hey, her collection wasn't too shabby. I have to admit that the idea of having a cool friend like this Hazel girl sounded pretty awesome. I was determined to actually meet her. Because, yeah, it's been five wonderful days staying here, and I still haven't run into her. So, one night, I settled down in the living room and watched a movie while waiting for her to come home. She eventually showed up at 2 a.m., Ugh, this girl wasn't kidding about coming home late. I greeted her and said, Hey, I saw you have an Xacta 35mm film camera. That's so cool. Also, um, would you mind if I take a look at your vinyls? She looked a bit confused and replied, I have a what? Oh, you mean those rusty old things? They're my brothers. I doubt he'd mind. He always talks to me nonstop about them. So I think he'd be happy there's someone in this house who speaks the same language as him. Ha! <laughs> oh, they're her brothers? How very interesting. This got me thinking. Is he handsome? And what about his personality? Is he an arty type with a kind soul? Daydreaming about this mystery guy became a regular occurrence for me. Oh gosh, was I crushing on a guy I'd never even met? How desperate was I? One day, I came home from grocery shopping. I was totally exhausted. So I threw the groceries in the kitchen and jumped straight onto the pile of blankets on my bed. Only, it wasn't just the simple blankets. What? Someone was under them. We banged heads. Ouch. I removed the blankets to catch this pervert out. Huh? I know this guy. It was my ex. What in God's name was he doing here? For the record, this wasn't my current ex. This was Nolan. We used to date back in high school, but I'd not spoken to him in a long time. So it turns out he's Hazel's mystery brother. Ew. This whole time I'd been accidentally crushing on my jerky ex-boyfriend. This made sense now, as we always did have lots in common. But, ugh. Thank you, universe, for ruining my vacation. 
With a dagger stare, I asked him why he had the audacity to be napping in my bed. He snorted, then said, Your bed? This is my house, in my room. The question is, what are you doing here? Reluctantly, I explained everything to him, and it turns out he was meant to be away on a two-month business trip, so Hazel put his room on Airbnb without asking him. The problem being, he came back early. He just shrugged and said, But I'm home now, so can you please take your stuff and get out of here? I'll get Hazel to refund you or whatever. This made me mad. I'd paid for the room. I had rights, so I was staying put. So I told him, I'm not going anywhere. You'll just have to sleep on the couch. He didn't seem happy about it. In fact, he grumbled to himself as he left the room. But at least he left. I thought this would be it, but oh how wrong I was. And that's when the war for the bedroom began. The next morning, I awoke to hear these weird squawking noises. Then I felt something flap in my face. Sleepily, I tried to whack it away and opened my eyes. Staring back at me was this massive gull. Ugh! Nolan! There were about a dozen of them hanging out in my room, all pecking and flapping around my stuff. It took me over an hour to shoo them out of the window. Afterward, I was so mad that I locked myself in the bathroom. After 30 minutes, Nolan thudded on the door. He urgently needed to use it. I opened the door with a smirk on my face and brushed past him. I soon heard his disgruntled shouts. Yep, I'd wrapped the toilet paper with duct tape. Ha! I wasn't done with him yet, so that evening I hid some cookie crumbs on the couch, and he woke up the next day covered in ant bites. He was like a real-life dot-to-dot. <laughs> yes, it's 2-1, loser. This went on for a couple of days. Nolan switched the toaster settings so my breakfast was ruined. Yuck. So I sneakily downloaded a fake cracked screen app on his phone and placed it on the floor. When he picked up his phone, he totally freaked out and started blaming his dog. It was so funny. All this pranking was exhausting, so I was kind of relieved when Nolan went out one night and I could just chill on the couch and watch a movie. Suddenly, the power went out. Great. The switch must have tripped or something. I put on the torch on my phone and was about to go and check it out when my phone rang. All I could hear was someone deep breathing into it. What the hell? I hung up and my body started to shake. All of a sudden, the door burst open and Ghostface was standing there. Terrified, I held my head and screamed like a banshee. But then I heard somebody call my name. Ava! Ava! It's me, Nolan. It's okay. I was so relieved to see him that I jumped into his arms and cried into his sweater. Please don't cry. I've got you, he said in a soft voice while he held me. I felt so secure and safe. Um, what was that he was holding in his hand? It was a ghost face mask. It was him. He knew I hated horror movies. What a jerk. I pushed him away and shouted, What the hell? Are you crazy? He just smiled and replied, It was worth it, because the hug was so sweet. Man, I hate this jerk. After that, I avoided him. So, okay, I did catch myself looking over at him and getting this weird, warm feeling. One time, he was playing with his dog on the beach, and I watched on from the porch. Did I have a crush on my ex? My god, I hope not, cause that would be pathetic. But I had to admit that, although his pranks were really annoying, they'd also been kind of fun. It made me reminisce on the old days when we were together, and we were so happy back then. But nothing lasts forever. (sighs) Hazel appeared with two cups of coffee, and we started chatting. I told her how annoying her brother was. She laughed, then replied, I know, sorry. I didn't know you guys used to date. I wouldn't have rented the room to you if I had. I get that it must be awkward for you, especially as you were the one who broke up with him, right? I did what? He was the one who broke up with me because he was moving away at the time and couldn't handle the long-distance relationship. And worse, he did it over a freaking letter. She looked at me confused then said, Oh, that's peculiar. 
as he told me he wrote you a letter telling you about his feelings. Then you shouted at him that it was over. I replied, part of his letter said, I love you and all, but this long distance stuff is like madly scary. So it kind of seemed obvious to me that he wanted to end things. She shook her head. No, I swear he just wanted to tell you how much he loved you. But obviously, my dearest brother totally sucks at writing. What an idiot. I told him he should have let me proofread his dumb love letter. So, it turns out, our breakup had all been a misunderstanding. I mean, come on, who writes love letters anymore? Anyway, the past was the past, so I decided it was best to leave it there. Besides, I only had a few days left here. On my last day, I packed my things and said goodbye to Hazel. I had to admit that I was really going to miss it here. Nolan was nowhere to be found. He must be celebrating because he finally had his room back. Whatever. It's not like I needed to say goodbye to him. I took a cab to the train station. On the way, I couldn't shake Nolan out of my head. He needed to know the truth about the breakup. I couldn't let him think that I was a cruel person back then. Stop! Turn around! I shouted out to the cab driver. I ran back into the house. Hazel stared at me in shock. Er, why aren't you at the train station? Oh, wow. I couldn't believe they wanted to get rid of me so fast. I was about to leave when Hazel continued. Nolan just took a cab there to talk to you. Let me call him. Nolan answered the phone and asked me to meet him at a lighthouse nearby. Oh gosh, I was so nervous. What did he want to tell me? Maybe Hazel had told him about our convo the other morning. I spotted him. He was holding something. Gee, I hoped it wasn't another letter. He blushed while looking at me. Then he said in a shy voice, I, um, you forgot something in my room. Then he handed me a bag. I opened it, and there was my lingerie. Oh, great. How could I forget them? So he wasn't going to tell me anything. But wait a minute. These weren't mine. And they still had the tags on. He giggled and said, Sorry, I swear that was the last prank. I just needed a reason to see you. Hazel told me everything. I don't blame you for our breakup. I blame my poor writing skills. The point is, I love you. I just love you. You're the only girl I've ever loved. Still to this day. I've never loved anyone else. Oh, gosh. I couldn't believe it. Although, I was pretty sure he'd just quoted that from a movie or series or something. As we all know, he sucks with words, and it sounded familiar. Anyway, I threw the bag of lingerie in his face and then wrapped my arms around him. So, from then on, the room war stopped. Not because I was leaving, but because we became roommates. <laughs> Let me tell you this. Actually, there's not much to tell. Only, when your boyfriend writes you a letter, please make sure you read it very carefully. Actually, scrap that. Just tell him to get with the times and to text you. It took a lot of effort, but I finally got into the military school that I've always dreamed of. I'm now one step closer to being an actual soldier. Ah! <laughs> hey, midget. Move it. You're blocking my way. What? How dare he? This rude guy deserved a lesson. Suddenly, a hand grabbed my fist. I looked up. Oh, it was some tough-looking guy with tanned skin and bright eyes. He picked up my backpack and said, First, you have to know your enemy. He's Eric. Before I could reply to this boy, he walked off. At that moment, the siren sounded, and I quickly got in line. Choose your groups, you have one minute. Looking around, I saw two guys looking as awkward as I did. So I shuffled over to them, and we became a group. Oh, but wait, why did that guy who picked up my backpack team up with that obnoxious jerk Eric? It turned out our groups would be our roommates, and we were placed in room P02, which was right opposite Eric's room. My roomies are Tom, who was forced here due to his family's military background, and Henry, 
a notorious playboy who was sent here by his father to stop his opulent ways and learn how to lead a disciplined life. What about me? Well, I'm a girl. My disguise is awesome, right? You see, I have a twin brother, Jack, so I took his identity, and voila, here I am. Ever since I was a little kid, I've loved martial arts and always dreamed of one day becoming a soldier. I thought life here would be great, but it certainly had its challenges. Every morning, whatever the weather, we have to wake up at 5 a.m. and run around the yard. The showers were ice cold, and worse still, because I'm a girl, I had to sneak into the freezing shower block in the dead of night when no one was around, and physical education here is surely rough. Although I train a lot, I'm still always ranked at the bottom. I also struggle to finish the massive meal portions here. Not only do we have to work out loads, but our chores are also endless. Cooking, gardening, ironing, helping out with constructions. I was a novice at these things, so I was super clumsy and messed them up. Luckily, I always had Tom and Henry on my side. Tom is a nerd, and although he doesn't like studying here, his grades are top of the class, and he gives me the answers to the questions I don't know. As for Henry, he gets top grades in PE class. And even though he teases me a lot, he's the one who protects me from Eric. Speaking of Eric, he's a jerk who teases weaker students in school. But he gets away with it for one simple reason. His dad's in charge. And as for that boy that warned me on my first day, yeah, turns out he's called Ellis. I can't quite work him out, even though he often hangs out with Eric and participates in his meaningless dumb pranks. One time, after Eric knocked a younger kid over, I saw Ellis go back and check he was okay. Hmm. Friend or foe? Who knows? Today we have Taekwondo class. Perfect. I quickly challenged a smug-looking Eric. Too bad he doesn't know I have a black belt. Ha! <laughs> and as I predicted, I kicked his butt in just three moves. K.O. I walked over to my two fellows with a big triumphant smile on my face when Henry suddenly rushed forward and pushed Eric down. Turns out, he was sneaking up on me from behind. Nice try, coward. But sorry, dude. We three always have each other's back. We were laughing about Eric's defeat when the lunch bell went. But, oh no. The room was locked from the outside. Eric has to be behind this. No worries. The food here sucks anyway. Tom said while pulling a bunch of food out from under his bed. <laughs> Again, Tom? You've already been punished twice this week for sneaking food in here. Suddenly there were noises outside. I went closer to the door to listen when it burst open and in stepped an officer. I stepped into the corridor to see everybody was gathered around whispering, while Eric was on the ground, looking pale like he'd just seen a ghost. Oh my god. The door of room P01, Eric's room, had weird scratches all over it. It looks like those scratches spell out a word. Jacob. So there's a monster named Jacob. Well, that's comforting. P02! You all missed lunch, so I want five laps around the yard. And also five points are deducted for bringing in outside food. Ugh. Points deducted again? At this rate, we'd never gain access to the entertainment room. Oh, here we keep scores between rooms. Just like in Harry Potter with the house's points. It's quite a competition. At the end of the week, the room with the highest score gets access to the entertainment room. You know, watching TV or using social media are considered a huge reward in the strict school. But it's hard to earn points. Meanwhile, you can get them deducted for any reason. For me taking a shower at the wrong time, to Henry skipping theory lessons, and now Tom and his snacks. Ugh! What does Jacob mean? Anyway, seeing Eric freak out like that was hilarious. Jacob is a name. Don't you see that, Jack? He's Eric's ex-roommate. I heard that he's missing. Hey, Tom, is there anything you don't know? Hmm, I see. But why did that missing Jacob scare Eric so much? We're never going to get into the entertainment room. It's all work, work, work in this place. Who cares about that stupid room? This weekend, there's a prom at the local girls' school. I have a step-by-step -step plan for us. We'll sneak into the school milk delivery truck to get there. Then I can finally talk to some lovely girls instead of those aunties in the kitchen. That sounds good. Hey, 
Maybe you'll even find your first love there, right, Jack? Huh, they had no idea. Anyway, the thought of getting out of school for a bit was appealing. That weekend, Henry stole some of the gardener's casual clothes, and then we hid in the milk delivery truck to attend the prom. As soon as we got there, Henry had already got himself all smitten with a cute blonde, while Tom spent all his time debating World War II with a girl majoring in world history. As for me, I really enjoyed all those tasty cupcakes. But why wouldn't the girls quit pestering me? I guess it proves that I look quite manly, right? We gotta go. The bus to our school is about to come. Change to your uniform. You have one minute. I quickly got changed, then ran after them so fast, I bumped into someone, and we both fell to the ground. I was in such a rush that I could only say sorry, pick up my dog tag, and run out into the road to catch the bus back to school. Where did you guys just get back from? They just helped clean up the cafeteria, sir. I just got back from there. Hearing this, the officer stopped questioning us. But, huh? Why did Ellis help us? Isn't he meant to be on Eric's side? While indulging in thoughts about it, I took out the dog tag from my pocket and was about to put it around my neck. But wait, it's not mine. Look, guys, this dog tag has the name Jacob on it. I quickly showed them the dog tag and explained the incident to them. I must have picked up that guy's tag by mistake. Could it belong to the missing Jacob? Or was it merely coincidence? I mean, Jacob's a popular name, right? The next day, as we were helping to distribute food in the kitchen, there were noises coming from the dining area. As soon as I went out, I saw Eric sitting on the floor, shivering in fear. Next to him was his bowl of soup splattered everywhere. At first, I thought he was playing some tricks to get us to clean up. But no, looking at the way he ran out of the cafeteria in panic, something must have happened. I bent down to pick up the bowl. Oh my god. And it was a dog tag with Jacob's name on it. But the dog tag I took by mistake yesterday is still in my pocket. Hmm. What's going on? Eric was so preoccupied with the Jacob stuff, he didn't have time to taunt us, so our room got the highest score for the first time, which means we would finally get to experience the entertainment room. But as soon as we reached the lobby of the utility area, something didn't feel right. A bunch of kids were buzzing in front of the entertainment room, where the hazy smoke was coming from. Thinking there was a fire, we rushed to put it out. But no, it was only a smoke bomb. Inside the entertainment room, Eric and his friends were fainting. People splashed water on his face, but as soon as he woke up and saw the words Jacob burned black on the wall, he blacked out again. Huh? Who did this? Was it Jacob? Was he not missing after all? Today we have P.E., but I'm on my period, so I made up an excuse to go to the school's infirmary instead. On the way, I happened to see Eric with his group of friends. I think Jacob's spirit is back to take revenge on me. You know that time? I locked him in the old warehouse and he just disappeared without a trace since then. Is it possible that he was... Stop talking nonsense. Maybe someone who knows what happened in the past wants to mess with you. I even took his clothes away. Oh god, he would surely want to haunt me. Oh my gosh, it all made sense now. Suddenly a large hand muffled me, then dragged me away. You better shut your mouth and keep this a secret. It was Ellis, Eric's sidekick. What a faithful servant. What if I don't? Especially since I met Jacob. What did you just say? You don't believe it? Here, I bumped into someone, and he dropped this dog tag. As for the one in Eric's soup bowl, I think it's just a fake. Ellis trembled as he took the tag from my hand and quickly left. Was he going to snitch on Eric or something? That night, while I was having dinner, Eric was back to jerk mode again, and he dumped his leftovers on my tray. The two sides clashed, and we all ended up with an hour's detention. The punishment sucked. They locked each of us in a tiny room containing one chair and left us to think about our wrongdoings for a whole hour. The next morning, the officer knocking on the door woke us up. Eric was missing and we were the number one suspects. This was ridiculous. What did his disappearance have to do with us? I told Henry and Tom about the other day when I overheard Eric and his friends. 
So Eric teased Jacob, so now he'd returned for vengeance? Feeling suspicious, we snuck into the school's abandoned warehouse. Yep, there was Eric all tied up and with a rag in his mouth. It's Jacob. His spirit has returned. He wants to harm me. Help me! Huh, look at that arrogant Eric being all scaredy cat. Call me Captain. Uh, no. Call me Farther. Then I'll let you go. Tom and Henry burst out laughing. But Eric just stammered and then everything started to go blurry. Then I must have blacked out. When the three of us groggily came round, we saw that the only thing left there of Eric's was his uniform. As soon as we got back to school, we heard from the others about how Eric had appeared in just as tidy whitey. Everyone gloated to see the overbearing Eric lose his face. From now on, he wouldn't dare tease anyone again. But this was the exact same way Eric used to pick on Jacob. So, Jacob did this? Was he back? Actually, I already knew who was behind all this. You dropped this at the warehouse, right? Ellis looked at me surprised and asked how I knew. We actually snuck into the main office to find information about Jacob before we got to the warehouse. And as soon as I saw his picture, I knew right away there was some sort of close connection between Ellis and Jacob. Call it twin senses. It turns out that Jacob was Ellis's brother. During his time at this school, Eric made his life a misery. But everything was kept a secret because Eric's the principal's son. So, Ellis enrolled at this school to get answers. Ellis took the dog tag back and handed over a picture of me with my twin brother. And this must be yours. I picked it up on the first day of school when you dropped your backpack. You remember? Oh my god. Was this for real? I snatched the photo and quickly put it away when I saw an officer approaching. We should get to know each other better, right? Since we both know each other's secrets. Whatever. Anyway... I don't hate Ellis, and Eric deserved it, so it didn't matter who did that. I turned my head to look at Ellis. He smiled as if he was challenging me. Uh-oh. I had a feeling my life here was about to take a turbulent turn. Hey guys, Private Davis here. Yep, Taylor Davis, the girl who secretly disguised herself as her twin brother to attend an all-boy military school. In the last part, I had to deal with my fair share of challenges, but having Tom and Henry, my two best pals by my side, made things way easier. But still, there were problems my two comrades couldn't help me with, such as this situation right now involving Ellis, finding out about my real identity. Not that I'm interested in your mess, but I need to find my brother Jacob. So, let's make a deal. I'll keep your secret if you help me find him. What? How am I meant to find a guy I don't even know? To my surprise, Ellis then truthfully told me his story. Turns out, he came to this school for two reasons. To punish those who picked on Jacob, and to find clues about his disappearance. Meanwhile, I coincidentally met this Jacob guy outside of school and found his dog tag. So I was the only lead he had for now. But could I really trust this guy? I mean, just look at what he did to Eric. If you don't want to do it, then I can go to the principal's office. Okay, so what? I found the dog tag while we snuck out to a local girl's school. That's all I know. If you spill my secret, I won't let you find your brother in peace either. So you better know a way to take me to that school. I'll pick the time to make a move and you just try your best not to get caught. The next morning, I was walking to class as usual when I passed a bunch of guys huddled together whispering something about me? Huh? Wait, did Ellis reveal my identity to everyone? Such a fraud! I ran to find him, but accidentally crashed into this boy called Finley. I helped him up as the whispers around us got even louder. Guess you're one of the alleged suspects too. Finley then told me that yesterday, someone discovered a box that looked just like a pack of candy in the bathroom, but inside were a bunch of tampons. So now the students thought there was either a pervert on campus, or that one of us was secretly a girl. And according to them, anyone who never joined the public shower was suspicious. Oh no, what if they found out the tampons were mine? Guys, hot girl alert! 
Everyone immediately forgot about me and flocked to him. The buzz on campus was that an inspection officer was staying here for a few months, and he'd brought his beautiful daughter Ivy along with him. People said she looks like a fairy with this ethereal vibe. Just then the inspector, Ivy, and his group stepped into the hallway. I watched them all drool over her. Poof, please. Anyone would think they'd never seen a girl before. She walked past these silly boys with a smug smile, but as soon as she caught sight of me standing there unfazed, she froze to the spot and stared straight at me. What? Was I supposed to show off my smitten face too? Dad, I need someone to show me around school. Can I take him? What? Why me? I couldn't even say anything as the principal had already agreed. Come on, let's go. Oh, you're so muscular. Ew, gross! Later on, she shooed Henry and Tom out of the entertainment room just because she wanted to spend time alone with me. Another time, when we were about to do our cleaning duty, Ivy popped out of nowhere and asked me to go hang with her. She even stopped two guys passing by and did her whole fluttering eyelashes routine to persuade them to do my cleaning duties instead. Ivy, I appreciate your help, but we all have our chores to do. This isn't fair on the others. Don't you get it, Jack? I did all this because I want to be close to you. I like you. I, uh, um, I think you'll be better suited to someone else. Then I ran out of there, leaving everyone behind stunned at my harsh rejection. For the next couple of days, Ivy was furious and looked at me like she wanted to tear me to pieces. And the whispers started circulating again. They said that refusing a girl as beautiful as Ivy meant that I must have not had any interest in girls. Or even worse, I probably was a girl myself, and I was the one who dropped the tampons in the bathroom. Gosh, this was bad. That night, as usual, I just stepped out of the communal bathroom after a late night shower when someone suddenly dragged me into the equipment room. It was Ellis. What's going on? Just then, footsteps resounded from the hall. I held my breath as I anxiously waited for them to pass by. Phew, that was close. Turns out, that afternoon, Ellis heard the officers discussing security tightening, especially in the student communal bathroom area at night. So he waited for me outside and hid me just in time. He saved me. We tried to sneak through the new building close to our dorm, but unfortunately bummed into Ivy. What are you doing here? Trying to sneak out, huh? Officer- It's not what you think, I- Jack came here to confess his feelings to you, right? Jack? Oh, uh, um, yes. I- I think I'm fond of you. Oh yeah? Then why did you refuse me the other day? He was just too insecure. I mean- you're quite the catch with your high-up dad while well, he's just a private. But he can't ignore his feelings for you any longer, so... Ugh, cringe. But it worked, as Ivy looked so moved and lunged forward to hug me. Then I guess we officially became a couple? <laughs> and as Ellis planned, the rumors about me being a girl were replaced with jealous gazes. Now Ivy followed me to every class, every break time. I barely had any time alone. This tactical combat course was my only chance to get away from her. We had to go to this warehouse to practice saving a mannequin captive. I was focusing on the mission, but still got caught by an enemy. Wait, it was Ellis? He seemed agitated and told me we needed to leave this Friday afternoon. As we were discussing how to sneak out of school, why do you need to meet up? We almost jumped out of our skin. Ivy! Why are you sneaking up on us? What did you hear? Just you asking my boyfriend out? Oh, I see what's going on here. You like Jack, don't you? Weirdly, Ellis seemed flustered. He was sweating and mumbling out nonsense. Was he that scared of Ivy? Suddenly, Ivy grabbed my collar, trying to kiss me? Panicked, I shoved her duck face away. Just in time, the siren went off, signaling the course was over, so I ran out of there. To avoid Ivy, the plan changed to early Friday morning. I had to fake an injury to get out of class. Ellis and I met up at the back door, jumped into the milk delivery truck, and let it take us to the local girls' school. When we arrived, I led him to the school entrance where I'd found Jacob's dog tag. We spoke to some students, but no one knew who Jacob was, and people started to stare at us as if we were creeps. <sighs> we were about to give up when this woman approached us. Why are you looking for Jacob? You look exactly like him. 
turned out she's Mrs. Walker, a teacher here, and she knows Jacob. Her husband found him dazed and injured at the edge of the woods and took him in. His health got better with time, but his happiness didn't. So when prom came, Mrs. Walker told Jacob to go and enjoy the night, hoping he'd feel better. But he returned early and was only invested in this dog tag he'd picked up from someone named Jack Davis, since that was also the name of Jacob's favorite drag queen who performed at big theaters. This incident then gave Jacob a push to take action. He always wanted to live with his true self, but he'd been lost along the way. So he decided to venture to find Jack Davis, the role model that might be the only one who could help him now. He had parted ways with the walkers to go on this self-discovery journey not long ago. On the way back, Ellis and I stayed quiet. I didn't expect Jacob to know my twin brother. Should I tell Ellis that I might know where Jacob went? But I couldn't just lead him to my home to find his brother as... My parents didn't know I'd disguised as Jack and joined this all-boy military school. If they ever found out about this, I could kiss my soldier dreams goodbye. When the truck stopped, I got off and was about to go back to the dorm when Ellis pulled my hand. You know that Jack, right? Is he your twin brother? If it's true, then please tell me where he is. I'm sorry, but I can't. I, I've got homework to do. Then I left as he called after me. The next day, I tried to avoid Ellis, but he was ahead of me. He was desperate, but I just shook my head. Y you selfish fraud! Right away, Tom ran to stand between me and Ellis while Henry defended me. What, you want to become the next Eric? Get lost, you jerk! Oh no. I tried explaining to them that Ellis didn't mean any harm, but they didn't listen and just pulled me away from him. I felt so bad. For that whole day, I kept thinking about what had happened. Ellis was right. I was selfish. He might never see his brother again because of me. I had to go help him. But when I got to his room, his roommate said he'd already taken his annual leave to go find his brother. Oh no. He must have figured out my home address somehow. I gotta go home, but how to get out of school? It wasn't milk delivery day. As I was thinking, Tom and Henry approached me, asking why I was acting so weird. <sighs> This was it. I guess I shouldn't lie to them any longer. Guys, I have something to tell you. I'm actually a girl. Then I told them why I came here in the first place, how things got entangled with Ellis, and now he went looking for my house as his brother might be there. I waited for them to be mad, but instead, they smiled gently at me. That's a pretty big secret to carry. Girl or boy, this changes nothing. You're still our friend. They were not angry with me. I felt so relieved knowing that I didn't have to hide anything from them anymore. Hmm, now I just needed to figure out a way to go home. We can handle this. Go wait near the back gate. And I did. Just in time, the fire alarm went off, and all officers guarding the gate ran to that direction. A few seconds later, the back gate suddenly opened and the CCTV went off, and I just slid through easily. Luckily, I arrived home before Ellis did. My heart was pounding when I knocked on the door. Then mom and dad opened it. Needless to say, <gasps> seeing their daughter dressed as a boy soldier was a huge shock. I quickly explained to them how I'd secretly taken Jack's place, and their faces kept turning darker and darker. How could you lie to us, then illegally enter an all-boys military school? What were you thinking? Right then, Jack, my twin, rushed down the stairs. He immediately got what was going on and backed me up. Mom, Dad, this has been Taylor's dream ever since she was little. This is dangerous. If you get caught, you could be sent to a juvenile center. Pack your bags and quit the school right now. In that heated moment, Ellis barged in. Jacob? Jacob, are you here? Where did you hide him? I tried to calm him, but it was no use. The whole scene was chaotic. Then suddenly, he stopped dead, staring at the stairs. Huh? Someone else was here. Someone with silky, long hair, a beautifully made-up face, in a super pretty dress. It was... Jacob. He apologized to my parents for his brother's behavior. Then we all sat down as he told us how he realized from a young age that he was interested in feminine things. So he used to sneak into his mom's closet and use her clothes and makeup. One time, his parents caught him and they were so worried about his deviant behavior, they forced him to attend military school, hoping to straighten him up. But of course, he didn't fit in there and was fed up with being teased by Eric. 
So when he saw a chance to run away, he did so without hesitation, cutting off all ties with the school and his family. Luckily, the walkers found him in the woods and took great care of him. Still, it wasn't enough. He needed to discover his true self. So we came to Jack's. I beg of you, don't make me go back home again. I can't stand the disappointed look on mom and dad's faces. I just want to be myself. I know it must be hard, but you gotta go home and face your parents. Once they know how you truly feel, they'll understand. Mom, Dad, I'm sorry for being so reckless, but being a soldier is my dream. Please give me a chance. <sighs> I can't let you do it. But you can have till the end of the semester to pack your stuff and say your goodbyes. That's it. Just then, I heard footsteps outside. It was Ivy. What was she doing here? You tricked me. I already knew there was something weird going on with you and Ellis. But you're a... girl? <laughs> Lucky me, I had your whole secret recorded here. Let's see how my dad punishes you, fraud. This is bad. Ellis and I jumped into his car and drove back to the school immediately. But we arrived back to an unexpected situation. The principal, aka Eric's dad, was already packing his things. And a strange lady with a stern look was sitting at his desk. Wait, did this mean we had a new principal? Yep, turns out the inspection officer came to school to investigate our principal on allegations that he'd been condoning his son's mistreatment of other students. And it was none other than Ellis here who had been gathering up evidence to help him. Then what about me? Well, in return for Ellis's assistance, the officer decided to let me stay and study here. In fact, the new principal even had some other plans. Finally, it's the end of the semester. Whew. And you know what? Our school now officially welcomes female students, which means I'm legitimately the first girl in school. I'm so grateful for our new principal. Meanwhile, me, Henry, and Tom are still the best of comrades. Obviously, nothing could ever stand between us. And of course, my parents are okay with me staying since I don't have to hide my real identity anymore. About Jacob, he actually listened to Jack's advice and went home to talk to his parents. They were shocked to see him like that, but as he poured his heart out to them, they decided to slowly accept the real him. As for his brother, Ellis, we went through a lot together, and now we're best friends. There might be some sparks between us though, but I don't know. Let's just wait and see. I'm standing in the middle of the room, wearing this extravagant dress and a glittery mask. All eyes are on me, but I can sense how ingenuine they are. This is supposed to be my sweet 16th, and yet all of these guests were complete strangers. Ugh, it's all that slimeball Gregory's fault. Actually, this OTT party was all down to him. Oh, hi, I'm Vivian, but my friends call me Viv. My mom, Jacqueline Mars, is one of the wealthiest people on Earth. So, I grew up thinking massive mansions, gigantic pools, and a floor entirely for toys was the norm. Well, at least I did until I turned 10. That day I was playing in my life-size dollhouse when I heard talking coming from the other side of the fence. I peeked over it and saw a woman and a girl around my age who looked kind of weird. Curious, I spoke up. Hey you, why do you dress so funny? Pardon? What did you say? You don't even have shoes on. That's so silly. You're the silly one. Bet you've never tasted this before, huh? So try it. Spoiled rich kids like you always look down on others. While in fact, you're no use to society. I just stood there dumbfounded as the security shooed them away. I never meant to offend her. I, I was just curious. So I rushed inside the house to find mom and ask her about this. Oh, honey, not anyone can be as wealthy as we are. That means you don't have to worry about a thing, sweet pea. Now go play so mommy can work, okay? Even to this day, mom's words still linger in my ears. I've grown to resent my family's wealth. I just wanted to be a normal kid. That's why, by the time I got to middle school, I convinced mom to let me transfer from my private school to a public one and wipe out everything about me online so no one would know about my influential family. I get the bus to school, buy clothes from thrift shops, and prepare my own lunch instead of bringing the gourmet dish the chefs make for me. A perfect normal life. Until Gregory, mom's so-called boyfriend, showed up. He sticks his big nose in everything. 
thanks to him, Mom wouldn't stop nagging at me about my clothing, my trashy public school, or how I gotta stop hanging out with the mediocre kids. Ugh, he is driving me insane. And to top it off, he gave Mom the idea of throwing me a 16th birthday party. I hate attention. Mom knows this. But what Gregory wants, Gregory gets. This could be an opportunity to introduce her to society and gain new associates. It'd be good for her when she takes over business in the future, blah, blah, blah. Poof. Please. The only thing that man cares about is himself and his associates, not mine. In the end, I agreed to a masquerade ball, on one condition. Mom has to stop interfering with who I should or shouldn't hang out with, especially my friends at school. And that brings us to the present, right when the host announces that it's time for… my first dance? Huh? My what now? Ugh. Gregory! I was confusedly looking around to find a partner, when suddenly a hand grabbed me. Birthday girl, come dance with me. Ugh, what a creep. Let go! Can somebody help me with this? Suddenly a boy around my age appeared. Oh my. He has the most beautiful grey eyes I've ever seen. Excuse me, sir. I believe the lady has agreed to have her first dance with me. Thank you, handsome stranger. As we danced, I couldn't help but stare dreamily into those gorgeous eyes of his. We were about to leave the dance floor when he whispered in my ear, Wait here. I'll be right back. <sighs> Who would have thought a superficial party like this would lead me to my perfect guy? Suddenly, I heard a snapping sound behind me, and as I turned around, my mask fell off. Oh no, a paparazzi cut my mask string. I tried to cover my face with my hands, but it was no use. Luckily, Mum rushed over and hid me behind her. Sorry everyone, but the party's over. We had a great time and hope to see you all again soon. Then she led me back to my room, while the security showed everyone the way out. From that moment on, my ordinary life ended for good. My face was plastered all over the internet as the billionaire Jacqueline Mars' daughter. Now everyone at school is looking at me funny. I don't get it, guys. I'm still the same old Viv. Oh, there my besties are. They would surely have my back, right? But nope. As I approached them, they went ballistic on me, saying how I don't trust them enough to confess about my actual background. So from now on, we're no longer friends. This is so unfair. I never asked for any of this. I wipe away my tears, trying to act like nothing happened. Huh? What's this? There's a note lying on top of my books that says, Hey, it's me, the guy from your birthday party. I'm so sorry for what happened to you. If you need anyone to talk to, text me anytime. Oh, so he's from our school? Wow, just when I thought no one's there for me, he showed up again. But there's no name though. Is he still playing this mysterious game? Okay, I'll just call him my masked knight then. From that day on, we texted non-stop. He just gets me. My family situation, my friends, everything. One time he even secretly slid a Blackpink concert ticket in my bag, since I once told him that I was their diehard fan. Another time, he sent me a gift card to my all-time favorite ice cream store, Ben & Jerry's, just to cheer me up on a bad day. Aww. This ice cream tastes delicious, but I can't help wishing the Masked Knight was here with me. All I know is he has the most beautiful grey eyes and gorgeous black hair. Hmm. Oh, speak of the devil. Hey, I have a surprise for you this Valentine's Day. Hope you're as excited to see me as I am to see you. Finally, I get to meet the boy I'm crazy about. I can't wait. On Valentine's Day, I was in English staring out of the window and thinking about my masked knight. I wonder what he looks like. Ladies, I brought your valentines, roses. Here you go, Viv. This is it. It's gotta be from him. Happy Valentine's Day. Have a taste of the rose, then come meet me at the pool. X. I quickly unwrapped the candy, popped it into my mouth, then rushed to meet my dream man. Well, where was he? As I tried calling him, the room started to spin. I saw the outline of a blurred black figure, then... Ugh. My head is killing me. Where am I? And whose hand am I holding? Hold on. Those eyes. 
He must be. Thank goodness you're awake. Uh, are you the one who danced with you at your birthday party? In the flesh. I'm Jeremiah, by the way. I had higher hopes for our first face-to-face -face meeting, but oh well. <laughs> Turns out, he always knew I went to the same school as him, but he was a bit intimidated by my family's influence, so he decided to get to know me via text first. He said the cops had found some sort of sleep-inducing substance in my rose candy. Before I could quiz him anymore on this, Mom barged into the room and hugged me. After making sure I was okay, she turned to Jeremiah and said, You saved my daughter. For that, I can never thank you enough. Please join us for dinner tomorrow night. Jeremiah seemed hesitant at first, but then he nodded in agreement. Hmm. The dinner did not go as planned. Between Mom's blatant interrogating and Gregory's menacing looks, I could sense Jeremiah's discomfort. Then when Jeremiah asked where the restroom was, Gregory insisted on showing him. When Jeremiah returned, he seemed flustered and made his excuses to leave. Gah. What had that annoying Gregory said to him? I quickly followed Jeremiah and apologized, but he just smiled and offered to pick me up for school tomorrow. The cops haven't found the culprit yet. So from now on, I'll be your guardian. How sweet. After that, I hung out with him every day. Great, right? Only, somehow it didn't feel the same as when we were texting. Back then we had a deep connection. Now it was just like two friends hanging out. Oh, and not to mention Olivia, Jer's childhood friend who can't seem to leave him alone for more than two seconds. One time, Jer and I were at the movies together but guess who coincidentally appeared and plonked herself down next to him? Yep, Olivia. Worse still, with their giggling and popcorn sharing, I felt like the third wheel. I was not having this again, so I just left for home in this random cab parked outside the theater. But bad luck. The driver doesn't know the way. He doesn't even have a phone, and I had to lend him mine for GPS. The guy snatched it out of my hand immediately. Rude! But wait, it was 9 p.m. already. Why did he still have shades on and even wore a mask? Right then, I realized the car had passed the town's border. Stop! The car suddenly filled with smoke. And the last thing I thought was, he has eyes that were exactly like Jer's. I woke up finding myself in this old cobwebby room. Where is this place? And that driver guy? I have to get out of here now. <clears throat> right at that moment, he came into the room with a smile. Don't you recognize me? Will you have another dance with me? Because I'd love that. What is happening right now? What he just said. Did that mean he's the actual masked knight? Maybe that's why I don't feel connected to Jeremiah. Why did Jer lie to me then? So many questions popped up in my head. Then suddenly I heard a car stop outside. That guy immediately went to check. This could be my chance of escaping. By the time I got downstairs, I saw the driver guy talking to... Jeremiah. So I hid behind the door and watched on. Cameron, just stop this. Getting revenge on our father is one thing, but this is a step too far. Take Viv back to her family now and end this. I know this looks bad, but trust me, I'd never hurt Viv. I didn't mean for her to fall into the pool. That's why I jumped in to save her. But I need her as bait to show the world what that jerk Gregory is like. He doesn't deserve to be her father. <gasps> I muzzled myself in shock. Gregory is their father? And that Cameron guy was the one saving me. Not Jer? Don't you forget who abandoned us when Mom had a close brush with death, then took all our business and properties, even our home, leaving us helpless? That jerk deserves all he gets. I was trying to process it all when another car arrived. Gregory's. I quickly hid under the stairs before he walked in with a bunch of bodyguards. Cameron, Jeremiah, my sons, haven't you grown up so fast? Cut to the chase. Give us back the business and what's rightfully ours. Then we'll let your stepdaughter go. Huh, <laughs> indeed. Like father, like sons. Very smart but still amateurs, my boys. You see, all that girl is to me is an obstacle blocking my way to the inheritance. So please, be my guest and take care of that little Miss Annoying. 
Aren't you afraid we'll expose everything you just said? And who's gonna believe you now? Jacqueline is mesmerized by me, so she'd believe anything I say. <laughs> that snake. How dare he speak of my mom like that? Unable to hold in my rage, I jumped out of my hiding spot and screamed at Gregory. What did you say about my mom? You slimy, lying traitor! Nice talking to you all, but the fun has to end here. Goodbye. The guards lunged forward, about to tie me up when… The cops smashed the door coming in, and behind them was… Mom! Stop right there! How dare you do this to my daughter! Gregory's face turned paler than a ghost as he mumbled out, Jackie, honey, why you're here? Um, but just in time to save our baby, Vivian. Cut the act. I already heard everything you said. And you're going to jail for a long time. Then the cops led him and took his crook guards away. Seeing Mum, I was so happy I rushed to hug her. Turns out, her investigations of the pool incident led her to Cameron. So when she confronted him, he eventually told her everything. That's how they came up with a plan to catch Gregory red-handed. Mum and the cops had been waiting in ambush around here for Gregory to show up. Then, well, you know the rest. A lot has happened in three months. Mum finally finished all the legal stuff, so now the property Gregory had merged with hers to gain her trust is now signed back over to Cam and Jeremiah. I realized that being wealthy isn't a bad thing, especially as it means with influence like this, I can help other less fortunate people and really make a difference. Now I help Mum with her business and her charity work, and I'm really enjoying it. I'm proud of my hard-working, amazing mom, and I'm proud of who I am. And guess what? I now have real friends who like me for me. As for Jeremiah, well, he apologized about everything. He used to fear his brother was going to hurt me, so he lied to protect me. We made up, of course, and became the best of friends. I'm not sure I can say the same about his brother, though. He did everything he could to beg for my forgiveness, but I just… can't. Then one day, Jer asked me to come by his home to visit his mom. She begged me not to think badly of her boys, especially Cameron. He's in love with you, you know? He always talks about you, and how he wishes things would have been different. Oh boy, her words are starting to have an effect on me. When I walked out the door, I saw Cameron sitting on the porch. He turned and looked at me, and I felt my heart pound for my grey-eyed, masked night. So, taking a deep breath, I walked over to him, just as the sun was setting. It was a normal Monday morning. I was standing by my locker when this Layla girl walked over, leaned against the locker next to mine, and talked to me in this sultry voice. Hi, handsome. Do you have any plans after school? I looked around in confusion. Huh? Was she talking to me? Usually girls like Layla didn't talk to guys like me. I mean, come on, look at her. She's the hottest girl in school. While I'm Felix, <laughs> just your average-looking nerdy guy. I awkwardly replied, Oh, hi, uh, I'm just doing my homework after school. Bye. Then I left her there, dumbfounded. But it didn't end there. At the end of school, she approached me again and asked, Do you want to hang out with me? Followed by a wink. Uh, no thanks, uh, I really have to finish my paper on the French Revolution. Then I walked off. Man, did she really want to hang out with me? <laughs> no way! She must have lost a bet or something. Even on the next day, Layla, one more time, made a beeline for me with this scary, determined look on her face while I was chatting with my friends. And in a serious tone, she said, Look, Felix. Do you want to be my boyfriend? What? All my friends started to cheer. I was so embarrassed that I shooed them away to get some privacy with Layla. Um, I'm flattered, but no. She scowled at me. Excuse me? Do you realize that I'm Layla Hall, the prettiest and most popular girl in this entire school? Not to mention a member of the cheerleading team? Ugh, cheerleaders are so dramatic. I calmly replied, Sorry, but you're just not my type. She shouted back, What? I'm everybody's type! I just shrugged and left. My god, that was awkward. But at least she got the hint now, right? Well, wrong. Because that's when the trouble just began. Firstly, it was this flood of junk emails and newsletters. Then strange phone calls from the spa nail salon. 
asking if I had made appointment for the day, which I obviously didn't. On top of that, there's a fake Facebook account that started spreading unflattering pictures of me around, picking my nose in French class, pulling this weird tongue-out concentration face as I checked over my essay. There was even a slow-mo clip of me chewing like a camel as I enjoyed my burger. Man, I was an ugly eater. While I was scrolling through these pics, Layla jumped out at me with a big smirk on her face. Be my boyfriend, then the pranks will stop. Right, of course it was her. Didn't she have better things to do? I shook my head and said, no thanks. This still beats being with an annoying girl like you. Then a few days later, as I walked into school, I noticed that everyone was giving me dirty looks. Was my shirt inside out or something? Nope. So what was the problem? I asked some of my friends and, geez, Layla told everyone that I kissed her, then ghosted her. She's a real-life Harley Quinn. Hot, but totally crazy. Only a lunatic like the Joker could love her. I'd had enough of her antics. I couldn't let her make me look like the bad guy for something I didn't do. So, at lunch, I charged over to her table and yelled in her face. Are you crazy? Why can't you understand that I don't like you? Then I shouted so everyone could hear me. Hey, listen. This rumor about me kissing and ghosting Layla is a total lie. She made it all up because I refused to date her. So please, save your dirty looks for someone else. Thank you. Layla shoved past me and ran out of there. Ugh, okay, maybe I was a little harsh. But you'd brought it on yourself, princess. Then during French class, she was absent, but no one knew where she went. Was it maybe because of me? Nah, probably not. But as I was walking home, I spotted her sitting alone on a swing in the playground. Just go, Felix. This girl only brings trouble, I thought to myself. But oh man, she looked so sad. So the next thing I knew, I was walking over and sat on the swing next to her. I asked, why weren't you in French class? Just leave me alone. Stop pretending you care. Look, I took a deep breath, then continued. I'm sorry for yelling at you in front of the whole school. That that wasn't cool. But what you did to me wasn't cool either. Shall we call it even? Layla stayed quiet for a bit, but then she nodded and smiled at me. Well, that wasn't so bad, right? So from then onward, everything was fine between us. She even smiled at me in the hallway. Whenever I saw Layla, this warm feeling came over me, and I couldn't stop grinning. Once, I even spent my entire lunch break trapezing around school just so I could catch a glimpse of her face. Oh boy, I think I've fallen for Layla. But why now? I tried to ignore these feelings, hoping they'd eventually go away. But then Valentine's Day came along, and Layla, being the popular girl she is, received enough roses to open a florist. Ugh, how annoying. I needed to do something. So after school, I went to her house with some chocolates and a teddy bear. As soon as she opened the door, I blurted out, I know I'm a big dumb idiot. Rejecting you was a huge mistake. Please, will you be my valentine? I stood there red-faced and prepared for rejection. But she just snatched the gift out of my hands, then said, Yeah, okay then. Oh my god, I couldn't believe it. Me, your regular nerdy guy, was dating the most popular girl in school. Love is really unpredictable. I was amazed at how open she was to my nerdy stuff. She even watched The Mandalorian with me and cooed whenever she saw Baby Yoda. But the one thing that didn't gel so well between us was, yep, you guessed it, studying. Layla didn't seem to care about her grades, and I didn't want her to fail, so I offered to be her tutor. But she was constantly yawning and staring out of the window whenever we started studying. Felix, I have an idea. Why don't you do my homework for me? In the meantime, I can go to cheerleading practice as we have an important contest coming up and it means the world to me, just like your math quizzes do to you. What? Was she serious? My God, I hated cheating like this. But she gave me that puppy-eyed look and me being the sucker I am, I agreed. Thanks, Felix. You're the best. She kissed me on the cheek, then immediately passed me a huge pile of homework. I asked her why she had so much and she explained that because she didn't understand it, she let them pile up. But hold on, why did she have Spanish? She was in French class with me, not Spanish. But she just shrugged and said her parents forced her to study it outside of school. Oh, my poor little pumpkin. One day, like usual, I stopped by her place to pick up her homework, but she wasn't home. That was odd. Today wasn't cheerleading practice, so where could she be? I looked through the stack that she asked her mom to give me and saw some Spanish worksheets. So I said to her mom, oh, she must be in her Spanish lesson, right? Her mom looked a bit confused then laughed. (laughs) You know Layla, she's far too stubborn to agree to extra classes. Huh? So the papers weren't hers? Then whose it was? And why? Suddenly I felt this uncomfortable feeling itching under my skin. I decided to confront her later at school. Then the next day I was walking through the hallway looking for Layla, when I suddenly heard some guys cheering, something about getting an A in Spanish. 
Wait a minute, did he say Spanish? I turned to see who it was, and to my shock it was Hector, the captain of the soccer team. Hector was popular for being all handsome and everything, but also for sucking at school. Someone must have done his homework for him, and you guessed it, yeah, this someone was me. Ah, it all made sense now. Layla and Hector must be a couple. They may have been hot stuff, but they both sucked at studying. So she was using me to do both of their homework. It all made much more sense now. None of this relationship was real. It was all just an act. And no way was I letting them get away with this. I had a perfect plan to expose them. During lunch, I sat down at the table closest to Hector. Then I went into lovey-dovey overload with Layla. I fed her cheese fries, then I stroked her hair and loudly told her how soft it was. I quickly glanced over at Hector for his reaction, but nothing. He seemed more interested in her burger than her. Layla raised an eyebrow at me. Um, are you okay? You're acting really weird. I laughed loudly, then placed my arms around her, then said, well, um, it was actually more like shouting. Oh, because you're so cute! But huh? Why was there still no reaction from Hector? He and his friends even cheered, and on his way out of the canteen, he gave me a thumbs up. Layla didn't look phased at all either. Man, somebody call the Academy, because these two deserved an Oscar. My plan was a massive fail. Ugh, this was so frustrating. I fell silent, and Layla noticed and gave me this quizzing look. Something is definitely off. You're being really strange. Okay, if she wanted to know, then fine. So I blurted out. I know that the Spanish papers belong to Hector. You're together, and you're just using me to do all your homework. I'm not stupid, you know. Nice meeting you, but please don't ever talk to me again. Then I left without saying a word. Well, that's the end of my story. A rather sad one, right? I would be lying if I said I wasn't feeling down about it. I truly do love her. (laughs) Whatever. I'm going to college in a few months, and I'll get to meet a cute, geeky girl who won't trick me into doing some other dude's homework. (sighs) Oh, uh, sorry, guys. Someone's calling me. My God, it's Layla. What does she want? We're done. Stop calling. What? Fine. Promise you'll leave me alone after this? Okay, wait, I'm coming downstairs. Uh, Oh my god, Layla's at my front door and she insists to not leave unless I have a talk with her. Ugh, don't move everyone, I'll tell you every detail as soon as I'm back. Jesus guys, you won't believe what Layla's just told me. The thing is that her cheerleading team had to practice a lot for upcoming contests, which means they couldn't study as much. Therefore they had to find someone who was willing to do their homework so their grades wouldn't slip. That's when Layla came up with the plan to win me over as her boyfriend. The flirting, the pranks, (laughs) They were all part of her plan. That was the truth. But Layla didn't know about the Spanish worksheets because her teammate Harper gave them to her. Turns out Hector is Harper's boyfriend. Didn't see that coming, right? But I was still super mad at Layla because she still used me. Then Layla took out some papers and showed them to me. Huh? It was homework with all B's on them. Then she told me, Okay, I admit that at first I didn't like you. I only approached you to take advantage of you. But then I actually fell for you as I got to know you better, okay? So I stopped giving you my homework and did it on my own. So, her feelings for me were real too? I couldn't believe it. Eventually I forgave her and now we're happier than ever. I must say, when Layla first talked to me, I thought she was this crazy girl like Harley Quinn who I could never like. But I was wrong. Turns out I'm the one who's crazy about her. So, I guess I have more in common with the Joker than I first thought. (laughs) I was grabbing a book out of my locker when some guy's shout startled me. Hey everyone, the results are over here! Oh, it's just the results of the Mind Buzz, our annual high school general knowledge competition. People, what's the rush? Don't we all know what it'll be like already? See, nothing's changed. That's my name, there, the first place of Willowmere High, as always. And of course, what came along with it were endless praises from everyone. Way to go, Millie, you're our school superhero! Oh my gosh, you're amazing. I'm so jealous of you. Yep. Hi, I'm Millie, the girl who always aces every school contest and is therefore adored by the other students, all the teachers, and the principal. Later that day, as soon as I stepped out of art class, Alice, my excitable best friend, jumped out of nowhere and squealed out, I just found this really cool place. We have to go there right now. No chance. I have the final round of the blast from the past contest tomorrow. I mean... History is my forte, so I'm sure to win, but I still want to cram in some last-minute studying. Come on! We all know you'll win anyway! You even said that yourself! So let's just hang out for a little, please? Fine, but only because I'm an amazing friend. 
Hmm, okay, I have to admit, this place was actually kind of cool. It's an adorable cafe hidden at the end of a street corner. But wait a minute, what's up with that sticker on the window? Isn't that the Leafmore High School symbol? No way we're setting foot in that taboo place! I tried tugging on Alice's arm and gesturing for us to leave, but she stood her ground and replied, Come on, Millie, we have to try their croissants. All the food bloggers are talking about it. But this is Leafmore's territory. Look! So? It's not like anyone will recognize us. Before I could comprehend what was happening, she dragged me inside. Oh well, it seems like we've gone too far to draw back, so I may as well sample what this place has to offer. Why was our order taking so long? And what was with Alice? Ugh, how many selfies did one girl need to take? I was clenching my fist to stop myself from anxiously fidgeting when two boys walked towards our table. Hey cutie, I've not seen you in here before. What grade are you in? Oh no, how should I answer this question? I quickly turned away, pretending to rummage through my bag to avoid his gaze, but they still didn't leave me alone, as the other guy said, Wait, this girl doesn't seem to be from our school, are you? Oh snap, did he recognize me? My skin turned clammy with nerves and I thought I was gonna throw up. Then suddenly a voice rang out. Sorry I'm late, have you been waiting long? Then he plonked himself down next to us. Seeing that, the two guys left. Phew! But who is this guy? Do we know him? Oh my god! Evan, it's you! Mmm. Is that the new Calvin Klein cologne? It smells amazing on you. Huh? Evan? As in, Evan Summers? The top student in Leafmore, aka my biggest competition in tomorrow's contest? To Alice's excitement and my puzzled look, Evan just lightly smiled, then got up to leave. <sighs> He's indeed a cold angel. What? All he was to me was arrogant. You're probably wondering what the deal between Willowmere and Leafmore is, right? They're the two biggest high schools in this town, but like the same poles of magnets, they repel each other. The two schools have been rivals since forever, competing with each other from academic achievements to collective activities. In competitions organized by the town, such as marathons, Halloween decorations, or even cooking contests. And of course, the students from both schools despise each other so much that we have boundaries in town. For example, this cafe is only for Leafmore students, while only Willowmere students are allowed in that bookstore. Breaking these rules could lead to outright carnage. The schools take this super seriously. Hence, there's even a rule saying we can't interact with each other. And dating is a real no-no. You see, as the top student in Willowmere, I can't let anyone find out I've stepped foot in Leafmore territory as if they do, my life won't be worth living. And also, because of my number one position, I have a responsibility to help my school win as many prizes as possible. And this history contest is no exception. I anxiously waited for the host to announce the results. And the last 20 points go to Leafmore High School, which makes them the winners of today's contest. From the other side of the hall, the Leafmore students erupted into applause, and they all charged at Evan and hugged him. Seeing the arrogant Evan with a triumphant face made me even more upset. Congratulations, you were amazing! Alice, we lost! Only by five points! Second place is still good, but it was me who was defeated by that Evan! Poor Alice is still trying to keep her shy smile at me. I didn't want to take it out on her either, so I quickly left. The next day I was walking along the school corridor, minding my own business, when I passed a group of students gossiping about me. Poof, she defo lost the quiz on purpose. Yeah, her question was so easy. Everyone knows that the first US dollar was printed in 1862. Why were they saying such mean things about me? I tried my best to ignore their jibes and distract myself with my phone, but what is this? Someone had uploaded a picture of me, Alice, and Evan all sitting together in that cafe the other day. Oh no, and we're still from this angle? We all looked kind of close. Furious, I went to leave, but Polly, this annoying girl, blocked my way and mocked me. Millie, if you don't like this place, you could have transferred schools. Losing to leave more on purpose is just embarrassing. I did no such thing. Not that it's any of your business. I hurried away from her and her smirking friends. The problem is, it seemed like the entire school had seen that picture and concluded that I'm a traitor. 
At least things couldn't get any worse, right? Wrong. My bad luck continued when I got my English Lit essay back. A B minus. This can't be right. I never get anything lower than an A. Ever! I was checking through my test when suddenly there was an announcement on the speaker, asking me to come to the principal's office. Millie, you're usually such an excellent student, but I've received some unpleasant news about you recently, and your grades are slipping significantly. I could only stare down at the floor and mumbled, I'm really sorry. I'd never been scolded by the principal before. This was the worst day of my life. Miss Garcia was silent for a moment before she continued. However, I still have faith in you, so I'm giving you one last chance to prove yourself. The town's hosting a Rube Goldberg machine camp and our school must win. Can you make that happen, Millie? I forced a smile and nodded. No problem, ma'am. The first prize will be ours. Trust me! This is my chance to show everyone that I'm devoted to this school. However, there's one teensy tiny problem. Physics is not my forte. It's all right, I just gotta do my best, right? I spent the next two weeks planning, researching, and testing out ideas with my group. We finally managed to create the perfect Root Goldberg machine. It includes 15 genius steps to complete the final task. We're surely gonna secure all these bonus points. Finally, the camp weekend arrived, and I was super stoked to show off my team's entry. Tomorrow will be it. I'll get Willemere's name back on top again. Then suddenly, Miss Garcia tapped my shoulder and gestured me over to an empty corner and worriedly said, Leafmore's machine is highly praised by the judges. At this rate, they're most likely to win, and that'll mean humiliation for us. Don't worry, I'm trying my best. We'll add some extra magnets and springs. It's no use. The only way we'll win over Leafmore is if their entry encounters problems. She sighed, then turned to leave. Feeling deflated, I stared down at my feet. That's when I saw a pocket knife, with Miss Garcia's name printed on it, lying on the ground. I picked it up and called out, Miss, you dropped your knife! But Miss Garcia didn't stop walking or turn back, and just did a snipping gesture with her fingers. Could it be that Miss Garcia meant... Yep, definitely. That's the only way. So that night, I waited until everyone else was asleep, then I snuck into the gallery and cut a piece of wire holding the light bulb of Leafmore's model. That should be enough. I was about to leave the room when suddenly the lights came on. What are you doing here? I... I... You just did this, didn't you? Um... Yeah? So what? Go ahead, tell on me if you want. This is all so meaningless. Then he sat down and started fixing his model. Huh? What's meaningless? Good God, he's so full of himself. Fine then. Just you wait, Evan. I'll beat you with my own talent. Let's see if you'll still be Mr. Arrogant then. It was my team's turn, and for the first three steps, the Rube Goldberg machine worked quite smoothly. But when it came to the fourth step, suddenly the wooden slide collapsed, causing the marble to fall to the ground and the machine to stop working. We all stared at each other in panic. No, 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 this couldn't be happening. We tested it many times this morning and it had worked perfectly fine. I rushed over to check what was wrong with the machine, but I struggled and couldn't find a way to fix it. When suddenly a voice said, let me see. I looked up, it was Evan. I stepped aside to make room for him when suddenly Ms. Garcia appeared. I see what's happened here. Clearly, Leafmore High knew the only way they'd win was by sabotaging the best entry. The whole hall started to stir, but I felt my skin prickle with unease. I didn't think this was Leafmore's doing. Look at Evan. He didn't even bother telling the judges about last night's incident. Immediately after that, Leafmore's principal, Miss Harris, said, Miss Garcia, you can't go around accusing us without proof. Clearly, you're the one who feels the need for underhand tactics to win, not us. Then she held out her phone and circled the crowd so everyone could see. I gasped in shock. There on the screen was a picture of me standing next to Leafmore's model with a knife. Miss Harris continued. Seeing as we managed to fix it in time, we decided not to mention anything else about it. But then you dared to accuse us. The crowd glared and tutted at me, and I longed for the floor to swallow me whole. I put blood, sweat, and tears into creating our model. 
and now people just thought I was a cheat. The worst part was they were right. I was one. The jury went off to discuss this. Then they announced their conclusion. Willowmere had been disqualified. Immediately, Mrs. Garcia piped in. This is hardly fair. That was the action of one individual, not the whole group. I assure you that Millie is no longer on the team, so let my school continue to compete without her. I froze in shock. How could Miss Garcia do this to me? It had been all her idea, hadn't it? She'd given me the knife. The realization of what just happened hit me and I fell to my knees and burst into tears. All that hard work and for nothing. Even Alice hugging me in comfort didn't release me from my gut-wrenching, sinking feeling. Then to my surprise, Evan said, Mrs. Garcia, can you explain why I found this knife with your name engraved on it next to our model? He raised the knife up for everyone to see. Oops, in all the stress of last night, I must have dropped it. Miss Garcia turned ghostly pale and everyone started to buzz about it. I can't believe you colluded with your students to do this. You're no different from her. Last night, Miss Harris instructed me to tamper with Willowmere's model, but I refused. As if we win, I wanted it to be fairly. The whole hall once again began to stir and copped on amazed as Evan continued. I'm so tired of the petty feud between our schools. It's so dumb and meaningless. The jury went off to discuss this further and came back with a new announcement. Both schools were disqualified. It's shameful. But, well, it's for the best. We really don't deserve to be here. Oh boy, that sure was eventful. The scandal between the two schools was hot gossip in the town for days. They even brought it up at the monthly town meeting. That's when the truth came out that Ms. Garcia and Ms. Harris had history. They were in the same year at school and were fiercely competitive against each other. So years later, when both of them became principals of the two schools, began this whole feud war. In the end, both principals were forced to leave their positions. So now what? Well, there aren't any dumb rules about where I can go anymore, which is good, because I actually really like it here. I've learned my lesson, and I'm never going to let anyone pressure me into cheating ever again. Peace has returned to school life, and it feels good. Oh, and as for Evan, I'm actually studying with him right now for our next Blast from the Past quiz. Only this time, I'm definitely going to beat him. Hey, Daisy here. I'm just your normal 19-year-old college girl living away from home for the first time and can't deny that it could get lonely sometimes. And I felt homesick a lot, but it's okay though, as I have Lucas, my loving boyfriend. Okay, yeah, his family is well off, so he always treats me to nice places and buys me nice gifts. A few months ago, he told me to move in with him in his family's mansion, and I've agreed, but don't get me wrong, I'm not a gold digger at all. I just had no other choice. It all started one night when thieves broke into my apartment while I was asleep. It was terrifying. I knew they were ransacking my living room and stealing my TV and laptop, but I'd rather stay put to protect myself. After that, I didn't want to be home alone at all anymore. Lucas, too, was worried for me, so one evening he told me, Daisy, I think you should come live with me. At least until you find a roommate. Wow. I wasn't expecting that, but I guess it made sense. I felt a bit awkward about it, though, as I've only been to his house, or should I say his parents' mansion, a few times. And although there was plenty of space, and his parents adored me, but I didn't want to feel like I was intruding. Sensing my apprehension, he continued, I've explained the situation to my parents, and they're cool with it. I smiled at him and replied, Well, okay then, but it will just be temporary. Before I moved in with Lucas and his family, I felt very anxious. I wasn't sure if I'd be able to adapt to their lifestyle, and I didn't want to upset his parents. I worried a lot, but not once did I think my trouble would be with the maid. Yep, you heard me right. On my first day at the mansion, a cheerful woman immediately ran towards me and greeted me. Mrs. Harris introduced her to me. This is our maid, Sarah. She's been with us for years, so if you have any problem, just ask her. We're all family here. Make yourself comfortable. Then Sarah quickly grabbed my suitcase and smiled at me. Miss, let me help you with that. I'll show you to the room. 
It was so strange having someone else do stuff for me like this. I could just smile back and follow her upstairs. That made me feel so welcomed here and how nice this maid was. Maybe we could be friends. But suddenly, a thump cuts off my thoughts. It was Sarah. She'd thrown my suitcase to the floor, then said, What on earth do you have in there? Carry it yourself. Your room is down the hallway to the left. And she walked off. What was that? Did I do something wrong? I quickly picked up my stuff in confusion. I didn't want to make an enemy of anyone here, especially not on my first day. So after I unpacked my stuff, I went down to the kitchen to help her prepare dinner. She was still so grumpy at me and told me to just get lost as I'd only be in her way. I remained persistent as I really wanted to resolve whatever her misunderstandings about me were. Eventually, she gave in and said, Fine, you want to help? Go dice up all of those onions. Yes, sure, but all of these? I asked her while staring at a basket full of onions. Are you going to help me or not? She said sharply. I replied, Okay, okay, don't worry, I'll do it. I tried starting up a convo with her, but she just rolled her eyes at me. Meanwhile, the onions were giving me hell. My eyes were burning and tears were streaming out. Ouch! When I finally finished, she stared at my swollen eyes and said, If you're that upset about living here, you could just leave. It's the onions, I told her. She smirked as she took them off me, then walked straight to the trash and threw them away, saying, You took too long. I didn't need it anymore. What? My face dropped, but I was far too exhausted to argue with her anyway. That's when Lucas and his parents came down for dinner. Sarah quickly set up the tables, then called me over with a bright smile as she pulled out a chair for me. Miss Campbell, please take a seat. Dinner is ready. Was she for real? I couldn't keep up with her constant change in personality. After dinner, I approached Sarah while she was doing the dishes. Look, I'm sorry, but did I do something to upset you? Yes, you sure did. You waltz around like you own the place, but you're nothing more than a parasite. And I won't let you worm your way into my home. Before I had time to process her words, she grabbed an expensive-looking marble plate and smirked at me as she dropped it onto the ground. Then, with a piece of broken plate, she quickly slit her hand and yelled out loud, Miss, I'm so sorry for vexing you, but you shouldn't have broken this. It's Mr. Harris's favorite plate. Hearing the crashing sound, everyone quickly gathered in the kitchen and stared at me for answers. I immediately explained, no, it's not like that. But Mrs. Harris said, it's okay. Let's help Sarah first. Then she led her off to get the first aid kit. I grabbed Lucas's arm. Babe, I really didn't do that. He reassured me with a smile. Daisy, don't worry about it. You don't understand. Sarah did it on purpose and blamed me. He laughed as if he'd just heard something ridiculous, then said, No way! I bet it was just some sort of misunderstanding. Sarah is really nice. Don't worry, you two will get close in no time. Now let me clean up this mess. You go and relax. I felt frustrated and fed up, but I reluctantly went back to my room. This girl was definitely on to me. But for what reason? Over the following weeks, her vendetta against me continued. She washed my white clothes with colored ones then intentionally threw away my stuff and made out she mistook it for trash while cleaning my room. She put extra hot chili flakes in my food, then rushed over with a glass of water when I started to choke, and so on. Worse still, Lucas and his parents wouldn't hear a bad word said against her. They were completely oblivious to how crazy she was. I didn't understand why she hated me so much. Was she jealous of me or something? All right then, if she wanted to play with me, then game on. So I decided to spy on her to catch her red-handed and show everyone her true self. My chance to expose her finally arrived. I was passing her room, and I saw her holding a watch. I recognized it. It was Mr. Harris's. She looked shifty as she placed it into her drawer and hid it underneath some of her clothes. Aha! Got her! I quickly ran to the garden to find Mrs. Harris and managed to persuade her to come with me to Sarah's room. Sarah stood by looking all innocent as Mrs. Harris checked her drawer but the watch wasn't there, and instead we found it still intact on the vanity in the master bedroom. Huh? At that moment, Sarah suddenly bawled out, Ma'am, I would never steal from you. You know that. I've gone out of my way to please Miss Campbell here, but she's intent on making my life a misery. Oh my god. Those crocodile tears. Did she have no shame? I tried explaining myself to Mrs. Harris, but she held up her hand and told me she didn't want to hear it. I wanted to make amends, so the next morning, I prepared Mrs. Harris's favorite smoothie and breakfast for her. I set it up nicely on the dining table, 
then went upstairs to get her, smirking at Sarah as she passed by. Mrs. Harris seemed happy with the gesture, but just an hour later, she said she didn't feel well. She was clutching her stomach as she glared at me and blamed me for poisoning her food. What? How frustrating! And Lucas wasn't even home for me to talk to. So I went to the kitchen to check the expiration date of everything I'd used. But I swear it was all fresh. I even went through the trash to check the used milk carton. That's when I saw some sesame seeds in there. That's odd, as I knew Mrs. Harris was allergic to them, so we never had them in the house. It had to be Sarah. It was the middle of the night, when flickering lights and clattering sounds awoke me from the most wonderful dream. Through bleary eyes, I saw my frantic parents <gasps> peering over me. Sweetie, you have to leave England right now. We've received a death threat. D death threat? What happened? Hurry up and pack your things. We don't have much time. But where am I going? And, and what about you guys? To the US. For now, Elise, you go by the name Chloe Stewart's. Remember, if anyone asks, you don't have anything to do with this family. At least arrange a comfy place for her, will you? Sweetie, I know this is hard, but we'll get you back as soon as this is sorted out, okay? Seeing mom and dad this worried, I tried to keep calm. I told them I'd be fine, and quickly left for the flight. I felt so unsettled about all of this. What would America hold for me? So, here I am at Phillips Academy, and I'll be staying in that room. Hopefully, I'll be safe here for the time being. <sighs> I couldn't stop thinking about what mum and dad had said. Who'd want to harm us? Dad owns one of the largest real estate firms in the UK, but he's a fair man who, as far as I'm aware, didn't have any enemies. <sighs> this is all so crazy, I needed some fresh air. But there was a white shadow dangling outside that reads, G get out? Suddenly, a strong wind blew, making me step back and trip over a skull. Why is this here? Then the whole room echoed with this horror movie-like sound. My head was spinning when I spotted something. Ha! These tricks can't scare Elise the Fearless. I was about to destroy this thing when... Hey, stop! Who are you? Who are you? This is my bedroom! What are you doing in here? This room is not just for anyone. Who are your parents? I... I... I was still trying to steer away from his suspecting gaze when someone knocked on the door. It was a girl named Rita sent by the school to help me out. She went on and on about the school regulations and boarding rules, but all I could think about was that boy. Any questions? Oh, not quite. I mean, the security here might be a little questionable. Aren't there any safety measures for the balconies? Actually, this is the only room here with a balcony, and it's quite eerie at times. Be careful. Anyway, here's your schedule for this term. Welcome to Phillips. Eerie. It was definitely a little weird. Is it because of that boy? Is he trying to scare people out of this room? According to the schedule Rita gave me, I have my first football practice today. But why are they all dressed funny? Everyone looked at me as if I was an alien and laughed their butts off. Here we call that soccer and this football. Ever played it before? Oh yeah, I forgot. I'm in the States now and they have different names for loads of stuff. How embarrassing. Don't sweat it. It's actually kind of cute of you. <laughs> so, what's your full name? We may know your family. Chloe Stewart's from England. Everyone then shrugged cluelessly. What a relief. I'm just a nobody to everyone now. However, Rita wouldn't let me blend in. She insisted my clothes were too sloppy for a Phillips student and dragged me to the mall. I like her, but sometimes she's so enthusiastic. If not a little... too much. Elise? Elise Stone? What are you doing here? Has your family moved to America? Oh no! It's the worst timing to bump into some family friend! I frantically looked around to see if anyone heard her, but... Elise Stone, huh? <sighs> it's impossible to escape her questioning. So I told her everything and asked her to keep it a secret. Don't worry, I'm not going to tell a single soul. I've got your back, Chloe. Suddenly, the whole mall was flocking to the entrance. Our Golden Boys, the top player of the varsity football team. Golden Boys? Is this some sort of K-drama or something? Oh, that's the guy from my balcony. On the way back to my room, I kept wondering what that golden boy was doing on my balcony. When I found myself in a haunted house. W what's that? Oh, this buddy was from today's biology class. As I carried the skeleton to the corner, I got caught in some toy spiders. Jeez. Suddenly, there was a streak of light from the balcony. Oh right, I forgot to close the door today. So this annoying intruder sneaked in. Again. Hey soccer girl. Impressed. Why are you trying to scare me out? What do you want? 
Well, I'm right next door and this balcony's always been mine. But since you moved in, I've lost the spot to chill. That's it? I mean, I'm staying here for just the time being and I don't really need a balcony. Plus, the less trouble, the better. If you want it that bad, then you can have it. But only the balcony. Please don't ever come into my room without my permission again. Sure thing. But since it's mine now, you can't just walk into my space either. Deal. That's settled then. This door is now officially the border between us. The next morning, I was carrying the skeleton back to the equipment room. Someone bumped into me and accidentally sent the box flying. Oh no, what a mess. Watch where you're going, you and your stupid thing. You were the one running around. Maybe slow down when you're in the hallway wouldn't be a bad idea. Are you talking back to me? You? Hey guys, chill. Right then, the girl pushed Rita to the side. But someone caught her just in time. Grace, why are you picking on the new girl? And you too, Aaron. Come on, man. I don't care. She better apologize to my boyfriend. Drop it, Grace. Are you okay? I know moving to a new country can be hard, so if you need anything, let me know. I was still flustered by his overly friendliness when Rita dragged me away. You know Jeffrey? No. I literally just met him. Oh, sorry. Jeffrey is actually my boyfriend. But we've not gone public yet. Oh, that explains things. I told Rita to rest assured, as I'm not interested in him. I also found out that he's the head boy. No wonder why he knew everything about everyone, including a newbie like me. But as long as I go by Chloe Stewart's, it shouldn't matter, right? But apparently what matters to Grace, the mean girl, is another story. After that incident, she wouldn't stop playing dirty tricks on me. Oopsie, I'm such a clut sometimes. Another time I noticed other students giggling at me in the hallway. I didn't know what was going on until Rita took off a piece of paper and stood in my back. This was such a Grace thing to do. Ugh. Can she stop acting like a nine-year-old? But nope. As I was going to class, she threw a snake at me, startling me so much I almost fell over. But thankfully, a hand came just in time to catch me. Jaden! Everyone listen up. Chloe is my girl. From now on, if anything happens to her, I'll be on you, Grace. M my... my girl? <gasps> Since when? Couldn't wrap my head around it, so I decided to ask him that night. Earlier today. Why'd you say that? Think of it as a thank you. For letting me have the balcony it actually means a lot to me right now well okay then but i wonder what's so important to him out there never mind we had a deal i'd better just mind my own business but who would have thought Jaden's statement would bring me so much trouble i suddenly became the center of attention especially with those golden boys surrounding me 24 7. i was gonna excuse myself when i heard the girls going primal over Jaden. of course someone with a goldfish brain like you would forget to eat Excuse me? I was just trying to finish this book before lunch. Who asked him to bring me food anyway? Great, now these girls had another reason not to like me. The golden boy started to act strangely, and Grace as well. This mean girl now watched over me like a hawk, while her boyfriend Aaron also acted up. Not to mention, Jeffrey always tried to be close to me, which put me in such a dilemma as I didn't want Rita to get the wrong idea about us. Then there was Jaden, who wouldn't quit acting like my bodyguard. I was enjoying myself at school festival when he suddenly appeared and dragged me out of there. This is getting too much. I'm not scared of some childish tricks from Grace, and I can take care of myself. <sighs> this isn't about Grace. A couple of times I've noticed someone watching you from a distance, and even following you around. I don't think it's safe for you to be in a crowd like that. Was I being stalked this whole time? Is it the same person who gave my family the threat? Did they find out I'm here? Who knows what could have happened if Jaden wasn't looking out for me all this time? That night, as if to confirm Jaden's worry, Dad called me saying they'd received another threat, pinpointing my exact location. Dad sounded extremely anxious and kept telling me to be careful. As I was trembling with fear, somebody suddenly banged on my door. Freak out, I broke the deal with Jaden and ran straight onto the balcony. You okay? What's going on? Some- someone's knocking on the door. There's no one there. Are you really that scared? I suddenly realized what I was doing. Oh gosh, this is so embarrassing. But is he blushing too? I quickly looked to the side, surprised to see all the gear. But what's all this? Are you trying to make bombs or something? No, actually, this is to attract the fireflies. Fireflies? Yeah, they've always fascinated me. I needed your balcony for my project. See that right there? It's their playground. Plus, it's really airy out here. Then he leaned over to switch some knobs on the machine and suddenly there was a swarm of fireflies lighting up the whole place, creating a beautiful fairy tale like scenery. His secret about my balcony had finally come to light, 
Literally. <laughs> I don't know what your secret is, but you need to stop being afraid. We'll find out who's behind this. His determination touched my heart, but I still can't help worrying about the mysterious door knocks. Who could it be? Since then, I stuck by Jaden. We were like SpongeBob and Patrick everywhere we went. Despite all the death stares I got from the girls, I finally understood why they were going crazy over him. He might seem a little kooky at first, but he's actually so caring and unique. Before the end of the term, the school organized this camping trip for us. I tried to make sure Jaden was always in sight for my own safety. It wasn't an easy hike, as more and more people dropped out except for Jaden, who didn't seem at all exhausted. Is he made of steel or something? I tried to keep up with him and occasionally stopped to catch my breath. But where'd he go? Panicked, I looked around for him, but all I saw were mountains and cold winds blowing at me. Suddenly, I felt a heavy stare on me, but no one was there. I quickly ran and called for Jaden, but someone grabbed me from behind. It was Jeffrey. Without a word, he just dragged me away. Well, what are you doing? Where are you taking me? Sorry, but I gotta do this. I've been waiting so long for this moment. You should ask why fate landed you right in the hand of your enemy. Uh, enemy? What do you mean? Are you the one behind the threat? My parents were, yeah. But now I'm in it too. Blame your dad and his stupid resident project that took away our land. The land that was supposed to be my family's mining area. And now we're going bankrupt all thanks to you. And you know what? The news reached Rita's dad and he's forcing us to break up. But this is our parents' business and I have nothing to do with it. Why are you taking it out on me? Well, maybe if their precious daughter is in danger, they'll do something about it. In danger? What is he gonna do? Right at that moment, someone appeared and freed me from Jeffrey's grip. Sorry for leaving you alone, but I needed to know who was behind this. You stay out of this. This is none of your business. You need to calm down. Don't get yourself in trouble because of your parents' mistakes. Jeff, you've worked so hard to become head boy. Are you just gonna throw everything away? Jaden's words seemed to touch him as we saw Jeffrey fall to his knees. I'll talk to my dad. I'm sure he could help you guys out with the business. Our families have always been close, and we've got you, Jeff. Seeing Jeffrey break down, I felt bad for him. What he did was awful, but his parents never should have put him in this unfair position. That evening, Jeffrey seemed deep in thought, when he suddenly dragged Rita out for a private talk, leaving everyone confused. Grace and Aaron then also left. I took a deep breath and filled my lungs with fresh air, when suddenly all the fireflies appeared in the sky, followed by Jaden. I know this is your call, but if you're willing to stay here instead of going back to England, I promise to take care of you. I looked at Jaden, beaming against the beautiful skyline, and I couldn't help but feel my heart beat a little faster. He was so sweet and caring, but why was he doing this? Did he have feelings for me too? Right then, Rita and Jeffrey came back. Jeffrey apologized for scaring me, while Rita also said sorry for not keeping my identity a secret. What's done is done. Let's just enjoy this gorgeous sight in front of us. The next day, as we returned from our camping trip, we all arrived at the hall for a school notice. But when I arrived, it was just my homeroom teacher and classmates there. We just heard from the principal you're going back to England, so we organized a small party for you. I hope you had a good time at Phillips. Everyone also wished me luck on my journey, but Jaden didn't even bother to say goodbye. Suddenly, all the lights went out, followed by the candles and Jaden. I respect your decision to leave, but I just want to let you know, I really like you. And no matter where you go, I'll be thinking about you. Actually, Jaden, I'm staying here. I already told my dad, but... That's all I want to hear, Elise Stone. Hey, I'm Madison, and I was born into a well-off family. My parents are successful entrepreneurs who always fulfill their dearest daughter's wishes. Beautiful face, supermodel figure, I have both. But unfortunately, I'm not the only one. I have a limelight-hogging twin sister, Olivia. Since elementary school, my sister has won loads of trophies for her singing. Everyone was so spellbound by her that they seemed to completely forget about me. And it didn't help when mom dressed us the same. Meanwhile, dad was always like, Whoa, I can barely tell my two princesses apart. Maddie, if your sister is tied up with her singing, you could help fill in her place in class. <laughs> Ugh, it's not funny at all. Especially when that kind of came true. Later at 14, when I was still trying to figure out what today's homework was, my sister went and won the voice kids. 
At school, everyone kept giving me gifts and praises just to walk off on me as soon as they realized I wasn't Olivia. Hey, it's not like I intentionally tricked them. Trust me, I'm just as sick and tired of all this as everyone else, so I decided to take action. Ta-da! Did you recognize me? Still Madison here. The one-of-a-kind Madison with pixie hair, smoky eyes, nude lipstick, and this edgy outfit. I look different, right? But... Oh, are you cosplaying Olivia and her upcoming MV? Madison, you're ruining your sister's image! I tried to be different from her, but it couldn't change the fact that I'm the twin sister of a famous singer. There's so many things I wanted to do, but just imagine if I tried out for the cheerleading team or a modeling contest. People would be, look at the tragic Olivia wannabe. <sighs> the name Olivia gradually became something that haunted me, and now she's constantly gaining in fame while I remain in her shadow. I have my own dream of becoming a model too, and I've gone to every audition I could, but so far, no luck. Oh right, let's check out my new video. Maybe YouTube will be the Kickstarter for my rise to fame. Remember to remove your makeup thoroughly, and the last step is subscribe to my channel to stay updated with the latest makeup trends. It's only been 10 hours, but look at this. There are over 200,000 views and 1,000 comments. Yay! Let's see. Like if you watch this just because you thought this was Olivia. When you're boring, but you have a famous sister. Olivia, you're the goat. Please reply to my comment. What on earth is going on here? No one talked about the video content. It's all about Olivia. Why can't I get rid of that name? I am Madison! Frustrated, I closed the laptop to leave, but turned around to see the mean girls surrounding me. Silly, you should have titled it Skincare Tips from Olivia's Sister. There would have been millions of views by now. Someone with no talent like you should just stay in the dark, please. Shut up! Just wait! One day y'all gonna become my fans too! Finally, what a long day! But isn't every beginning tough? Me quitting would be exactly what those mean girls wanted, so I can't give up now. I was struggling to set up my camera when mom opened the door and peeked in. You started a YouTube channel? Why not ask your sister to help promote it? Ah, uh, but no worry. Everyone can obviously see that you're Olivia's sister. You'll probably receive a gold button soon anyway. Ugh, what do you know? I don't even need her help. And please stop entering my room without knocking. Nobody acknowledges my effort just because I look like her. Fine then, just wait and see. In two more months, I'll be 18 and be able to do one thing I've been dreaming of. That will put an end to all this unfairness I had to suffer. This is it, the moment I've been waiting for. Right here, right now, I'll be reborn. I'm ready to start my life anew. You can open your eyes and look at yourself, Ms. Lewis. <sighs> okay, three, two, one. O-M-G in the mirror. A beautiful face, a stranger, not like Olivia's or anyone I ever know. Finally, I can live my life with my famous sister out of my way. Hmm, I wonder how my parents would react to this face that I myself don't even recognize. Hey, I'm home. Hello, but who are you? It's Madison, aren't you? What happened? Did you get plastic surgery? Plastic surgery? Didn't you say you were on vacation with your friends? Your beautiful face. Why did you? You mean Olivia's beautiful face. I'm done living in her shadow. Then I ran straight to my room, leaving them there all stunned. The next morning at school, all the girls' curious eyes were on me. And the boys? Needless to say, people were buzzing around. But there was no Olivia nor Madison to be heard. Nobody recognized me. I am the one and only now. Hey, Angel. Are you lost? Let me show you around. Since when did this mean girl become so friendly? You moving here is the right decision. Our school is the best in the state. Boring! If it weren't for my parents' new investment in this area, I wouldn't be at this shabby place. This fame-seeking silly girl instantly bought my bluffing. Her eyes widened, looking at me like a puppy. Then she did everything I asked her to. Buying me sodas, carrying my bag for me, and even wiping my seat. <laughs> Suddenly, Alicia walked over and nudged Zara. Where have you been? I told you to get me a latte. And who's she? Oh, this is my new bestie. And you should go get your latte yourself, as I'll be busy showing my friend here around, right? Alicia's frown face was a picture. <laughs> what a solid friendship these mean girls have. But the fun had only just begun. As the teacher did a roll call, I raised my hand up at the sound of Madison Lewis. The whole class gasped, and you betcha, Alicia and Zara's bewildered faces were hilarious. Didn't see that coming, huh? By recess, the whole school had heard the breaking news. 
Me, Madison, just got plastic surgery. Some were showering me with flattery, while some just kept judging the size of my eyes or my nose bridge, blah, blah, blah. But no one compared me to Olivia anymore. They just forgot about my famous twin sister. That's all I need. Madison is unique. Ouch! What's wrong with you? Are you blind? It was you going the wrong way, Madison. Um, he looks so familiar, but I still can't think of his name. He's... It's Dylan. Have you seriously forgotten my name already? That's right! My old neighbor Dylan! His family must have moved back to town again. But how could you recognize me right away? You look a bit different, but I can still tell from your voice. Forget the past. I'm the new Madison. The best version of Madison. Then I walked away from him. Now I'm finally free to do whatever I want without being compared to Olivia! I easily got that cheerleading captain title. From this spot, I can see all the impressed spectators and Zara's look of fury. <laughs> she was the former captain who got dethroned by me. Then I went on and won the school beauty contest too. Alicia's boyfriend, Sid, even dumped her to chase after me. Who's the loser now, girl? But of course, a jerk like him didn't interest me. So I bluntly rejected him in front of everyone. One afternoon while I was going home, Sid jumped out of nowhere and blocked my way. Babe, girls are lining up to date me, but I picked you! Be my girl and you'll see. Come on, just one dinner. Let go of me! Suddenly a big looking guy rushed in, scared Sid off, and then offered to take me home. He introduced himself as Isaac, and turns out we were in the same chemistry class. Oh god, how come I never noticed this handsome boy? Probably chemistry had sucked the life out of me every time I entered that lab room, but it's okay. We can rebuild our chemistry here now. After that day, we texted each other all of the time, and a week later we became an item. Fast, yes, but when you know, you know. Isaac took care of me during workouts, waited in the salon for hours, and even kept me updated with fashion trends. He's just perfect. But one time, when we walked hand in hand at the mall, I caught sight of Dylan's cold face. I suddenly felt awkward and tried to avoid his gaze. Strange, but why bother? Isaac and I were too busy discussing our upcoming plans anyway. I finally released my second video, and no one mentioned Olivia, but Gigi, Bella, Lily, Maymac? Now they're seeing me like those hot girls? Ridiculous! And talk kept coming about how I look like other stars. Maybe she brought their photos and asked the surgeon to copy them, but no way can Replica compete with the original. Still, isn't it better to resemble your own sibling than being some stranger's copycat? <laughs> so, did I really look like a carbon copy of someone else? Again? My rush to Isaac. He's the only one I can trust. Uh, just a little, babe. But if you don't like it, there's always a way. So I continued to undergo many other surgeries to find the perfect, unique Madison. Isaac was always there to encourage me. He was the one who suggested what part I should fix next. Sharper jawline, thinner nose, fuller lips. He has an eye for this, right? Seems like your eyes still need some fixing. I'll take you there next week. More? I know Isaac only wanted the best for me, but after pouring my fortune on endless plastic surgeries, I was completely broke. And no way would my parents agree to lend me some. Why not ask Isaac, you wonder? I can't do that. I'm not a gold digger. The surgery appointment was coming up, but I still couldn't gather enough money. What to do? What's wrong? Fighting with your guy? Desperate to offload, I blurted out my problem. So, could you help me out? I'll pay you back as soon as possible. I don't know why you think you need all this surgery. If Isaac really loved you, no way would he make you do this. Let me knock some sense into this dude. Dylan seemed so mad. I tried to pull his hand, but to no avail. Thank goodness someone blocked him. That's Olivia. I don't know what she said, but Dylan calmed down and went inside. Then Olivia walked towards me. You're already so pretty, Madison. Don't mind what others say. You guys don't know me at all. I'd rather be weirdly ugly than be pretty, but look the same as someone else. I don't want to be a copy of anyone. Then I stormed off immediately. Waking up after a restless night, I was reaching my phone to call Isaac, then saw an envelope of money on the nightstand. Is this from Olivia? Why did she... Never mind. No time to think, else I'm gonna be late for my appointment. Look, my face has healed just in time for my graduation ceremony. Pretty, huh? But I haven't been able to bring myself to be happy at all, as it's been over a month since Isaac ghosted me. After the eye surgery that day, Isaac insisted I have my nose fixed too. I said I needed more time to recover, but he got annoyed and just left. I've been looking forward to this graduation, which is compulsory for everyone, so he won't be able to avoid me anymore. 
My parents came too, but probably for Olivia. And today's spotlight is definitely hers. Suddenly, the crowd surrounding my sister gravitated to something else. Hang on, Isaac? Oh. My. God. Standing next to him is a girl who looks exactly like me! And her dress is identical to the one Isaac once gave me. I rushed over to confront him, but he flung me away. Wow, how buzzing! Both the real deal and the knockoff are here. Can you even tell them apart, Isaac? Stop saying nonsense. My princess is the one and only. Hey, you really do look a lot like me. Who are you? So after countless surgeries, I was still a doppelganger? All I want is just to be myself, to be unique! Why is it so hard? I felt rage filling up my body. I ran to the restroom to calm myself down, but it didn't help because I overheard the truth. Isaac and Naomi broke up when she moved abroad with her family. Guess she's back now. Yeah, how much he must love her to do all this. Great, now I get it. Isaac only wanted me to get plastic surgery to look like Naomi. But once his ex is back, he threw me away like a broken toy. So the gossip girls at school are definitely not missing out on this chance to mock me. Girls, stop! My sister, it's you who needs to stop. Don't you know you're the cause of everything? Calm down, Madison. It's completely normal to look like someone. To me, and to your family, you've always been the one and only Madison. No! I've never been seen as the only one! Then I told Dylan everything I'd bottled up inside, why I absolutely needed plastic surgery, why I was so obsessed with the fact that I resembled my sister. Everybody had always thought of me merely as Olivia's shadow. I never knew that's how you felt. I'm sorry, Madison. We are such bad parents. Startled, I turned around to see everyone. Madison, I've never looked down on you. I only thought I could use my reputation to make things easier for you. We always try to do the best we can for you two. We thought this change in appearance was what you wanted. If only we'd realized the painful reason behind it. Oh, wow. They actually cared this much about me? I cried even louder and ran straight into their open arms. Maybe Dylan was right. Maybe I really am special just for who I am, not for what I look like. The next day, I went to school to clear up my locker. High school is over. Now I can shake off all the bad memories I had here. Let's start things anew. Oh, finally found you. Um, Naomi, right? I, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to copy you. I didn't know. It's all right. I know it wasn't your fault. I swear, I had no idea Isaac was that much of a jerk. I immediately dumped him and exposed him online. How could he think us girls are just replaceable items? He even had the cheek to cry and beg me. But men like him don't ever deserve to be near us. I thought you'd be angry with me. For what? Madison, I'm truly sorry for what you had to go through. But everything has a bright side to it, don't you think? What do you think about having another twin sister? My dream of becoming a star on a runway has finally come true. But the most amazing thing was finding a companion with the same passion as me, who's none other than my new identical twin, Naomi. Bet no one can tell us apart. Miss Madison Lewis, would you go on a date with me after this? Oh, but I'm Naomi. Don't ever think you can fool me, Madison. You've always been different in my eyes. one step into the hallway and I could already hear all kinds of whispers going all around. Um, what happened? Did you forget, Sandra? It's Monday. <sighs> oh, not again. Who's the unlucky victim this week? Dorothy! It's Dorothy! <laughs> Look what embarrassing deed she's done! So, it was a photo of the resident mean girl, Dorothy, on a date with some old rich guy. Ben and I had zero interest in those kinds of things, but these kids on the other hand... Hey, there she is! This was the third Monday in a row that our school had turned into this gossiping chaos zone. Why, you ask? Three weeks ago, out of nowhere, a bunch of random QR codes appeared stuck to some of the lockers. Curious, we scanned them and got access to this mysterious blog by someone called Quiet Night. They said they wanted to expose the true face of this prestigious school. So, every Monday at 2 a.m., they would reveal someone's dirty secret. And the first secret belonged to the beloved basketball team captain, Lewis. Turns out he flunked the last match on purpose so the rival school that his secret girlfriend attended would win. 
At first, everyone doubted it, but then someone found the girlfriend's Twitter where she posted a celebration photo. So, there you go. Everything became clear as day. Lewis immediately lost his captain title and the entire school cancelled him. While everyone was still buzzing with that, already came the next Monday secret. It was Mr. Worthing, our popular math teacher. His classes were known for their top performances. But as it turned out, he had always accidentally leaked the questions to his students before every exam. The rumor reached the principal and he immediately had people look into it. Unfortunately, it was true, so Mr. Worthing was fired. And as you've heard, little Miss Dorothy was the third unfortunate victim. To be honest, she definitely hadn't been the nicest girl. She's a nightmare to all the new kids especially. So when her shameful secret was revealed, everyone seemed to be somewhat satisfied and talked about it non-stop. My BFF, Mary, was no exception, as Dorothy was a rival for her Queen Bee status. At lunchtime, we arrived at the cafeteria, but weirdly, nobody lined up to get lunch. They were all looking around at something. Turns out, Dorothy was here too. She's sitting alone at a table. Not wanting to miss an opportunity to taunt her longtime rival, Mary rushed straight over there. What's wrong? Your bald lover didn't take you out to lunch today? As soon as those words came out of Mary's mouth, everyone burst out laughing. Benjamin and I had to drag Mary out of there right away to avoid any calamities. What are you guys doing? I'm not done yet. This isn't cool. Let's just stay out of it. What? She deserves it. You know the clearest what a horrible person she is, Sandra. Or have you forgotten how she picked on you? Well, it's true. I was also one of Dorothy's victims when I just got here. Ben and Mary were the ones who stuck up for me. That's also how our precious friendship all started. Ever since then, we've been the iconic trio of the smartest kids at school. Pretty sweet, huh? However, the recent dramas have undeniably affected our studies. It's like students are coming here just to gossip and they keep chatting in class, making concentrating extra hard. Monday mornings became the biggest event in school. Everyone looked forward to it, guessing who's the next chosen one, as the embarrassing secrets continued seeping out. How Justin looks cool chewing his gum all the time, but he actually does this to mask his bad breath problem. Hardworking Julia bought her essays off the internet. The parking lot car spray painter turned out to be none other than Goody Two Shoes Brandon. It became apparent that any one of us could be next. So people started to panic, praying that their name wouldn't be mentioned. Every Monday morning, I arrived at school to see everyone looking like zombies, cause they'd all stayed up all night waiting for the quiet night's post. The mystery blogger had to be one of us to know all kinds of personal secrets like this, so everyone became extra cautious of each other. It's a mess and this has to stop. We needed to figure out who the quiet night was and stop this. But Mary wasn't convinced. How are we supposed to find them? There's zero clue. Stop wasting time. Let's just focus on studying, Sandra. There's no way they didn't leave any trace. We just have to stand up together. Nope. If you want to, then just do it alone. What's wrong with you? Weren't you usually the first one to avoid dramas like these? Because we could be next. So what? I'm not scared. I have nothing to hide. Then she left in a sulky manner. Mary might not care, but I did. I spent the night trying to piece the clues together when my phone had a pop-up. Ugh, was it 2am already? Who could it be this week? I pressed to see. It's Mary! Oh no, is it about that thing? Yep, that's it. The secret about Mary's background has been revealed. Her parents aren't successful business owners, and of course, Mary is not a rich mistress like how she always acted like either. I accidentally found out about this when I saw her bargaining about the rent in front of a small house in the suburbs. When I asked Mary why she had to lie like that, she just got all defensive. What do you know? If people knew the truth, they would laugh in my face. I of course didn't want to hurt Mary, so I always kept it a secret. <sighs> but now, everyone has found out in the worst way. The next day, Ben and I saw Mary walking toward us, looking exhausted, while everyone's eyes were on her. Yo, how'd you think she's able to afford those flashy outfits? Didn't that blogger say she always wears cheap secondhand clothes? Pathetic! Hearing those words, Ben and I gave those kids death stares and rushed to get Mary out of the crowd, but she suddenly snapped at me. Sandra, you're behind all of this, aren't you? Huh? What? Mary, what? What do you mean? Why would I do that? 
You're the only one who knew my secret. If it wasn't you, who else could it be? You are the quiet knight. What she said quickly caught everyone's attention, and I felt everyone's curious eyes fixed on us. Mary, that's not right. Remember, it's Sandra who called on everyone to find the culprit. That was clearly a distraction to fool everyone. Mary then continued explaining her reasonings for why she suspected me. The blogger only ever typed in lowercase just like I always did, and she also mentioned my habit of staying up late. To make it even worse, the next Monday, that blogger suddenly stopped posting, making everyone certain it was me. So I was instantly labeled a traitor to my friends and even a germ who raised hatred among students in this school. Everywhere I went, people badmouthed me, and no one except for Benjamin wanted to sit by me at lunch. I wasn't even allowed in the library anymore, as everyone would be talking about me which would cause disturbance. Worst of all, the teachers hated me too. One time in math class, I volunteered to solve a difficult equation, but all I got back from the teacher was, Sandra, if only you just used your intelligence for studying, not for messing up other people's lives. Then everyone heartlessly laughed at my face. The tension was draining me, so I went out to take a breather. After recess, I got back to the classroom to find a box in my desk drawer. Oh no, wasn't it the love letters I'd written for Lewis? I mean, yes, I used to have a crush on the basketball captain, but it was a long time ago, and I never sent the letters. How come they are all here? I sure had hidden them in the corner of my locker. Is it the creepy quiet night messing with me? Ugh. That's enough. I gotta unmask this jerk ASAP. Hmm, who could it be? Who had the ability to spy on people undetected? I was trying to figure this out when a smug-looking Dorothy appeared. Jeez, look at her. Can't believe she's the coward who destroys what she couldn't have. Too bad for Lewis that he ended up involved in this. Oh, such a pathetic little girl. Doesn't even have the guts to send any of the letters. <laughs> Oh. My. God. Did they just say letters? What letters? What on earth are you talking about? There's no mistaking your handwriting. She showed me bunches of photos of my letters. Oh no. Did she take revenge on me because she thought I was the snitch of her dating news? Not leaving me a chance to explain, they just laughed and continued mocking me. I couldn't face going to school and being tormented for something I didn't even do. So I faked being sick to stay home for a few days. But it's been a week and I still didn't feel better. Suddenly, there was a strange sound by the window. Turns out, it was Benjamin. Sandra, please stop hiding away. You can't let them beat you. You're better than this. What else can I do? Everyone's convinced it was me. Follow me. I know someone who can help. Now, I was sitting in a cafe with Benjamin and Max, an IT genius in our school. Benjamin insisted this guy could help identify the anonymous blogger. After just a few minutes of checking the IP, Max has been able to track it down. But, huh? It led to Mary's place? Huh? No way. This makes no sense. I gotta talk to Mary. Calm down. Don't say a word about this to anyone for now. Just let me take care of it. I had no clue what Benjamin was planning. He said he would help me clear up the case, but nothing happened for days. Until now, he insisted I come to watch this basketball game. What's the point? It just gave others a chance to mock me further. While immersed in my thoughts, suddenly, I heard someone's voice on the loudspeaker. It was Benjamin! Hi everyone, I'm sure you guys are tired of the Quiet Nights blog by now, right? Yeah, at first, I just wanted to entertain you all a bit after boring hours of studying. But I guess it's no longer fun, huh? <laughs> I'm sorry then. I'll stop now. Thanks for tuning in. What on earth is he doing? Now, the entire sports hall was buzzing. Is it really you? Benjamin was about to reply when Mary jumped out. No, it can't be you. Stop wasting time protecting Sandra. How could you possibly know where her love letters were kept? Or about Dorothy's secret? So, you tell me. Who knew those things then? Mary looked taken aback and confused. Then Dorothy appeared. It's her. It's her who gave me Sandra's locker key. Wh what? So it really was Mary. I was still hoping that Ben's friend made a mistake somewhere instead, but... Why, Mary? I don't understand. Of course you don't. You're not in my shoes to judge. Turns out at first, Mary created the blog for the sole purpose of getting revenge on Lewis for being a cheater. He always told Mary that he wanted to date in secret to avoid peering eyes, but it was just an excuse so he could sneak around with other girls. 
Which is why this was news to both Ben and me. How about the math teacher? What has he ever done to you? He had no work ethic, so he deserved it. I always studied really hard, but he said that girls like me only ever cared about our appearance. He still thought my good grades were from copying these two. And you, Dorothy? It serves you right for the arrogant habit of bossing newbies around. Then she blatantly left the crowd as if she had nothing to do with the school drama all this time. I tried to chase after her, but I was stuck amid this angry crowd. There's still something she hasn't explained yet. The following days, Mary still went to school, but all of the other students isolated her. Benjamin and I tried to approach her, but she went out of her way to avoid us. So, after school, we decided to follow her. We saw her going to the cafeteria, but not to buy things, but to help the lunch lady clean up. Mary, stop being like this. You've still got a friend in me, but don't you think I deserve an explanation to? She then finally sat down and talked to us. Mary would have stopped after exposing the three people she hated, but when she saw everyone eagerly waiting for the news every Monday, she found it interesting and continued to bring up other embarrassing things. But then, when things started getting serious, she panicked and looked for someone to blame, and that person was me! Because I was the one who first came up with the idea of tracking down this anonymous blogger. Furthermore, she was angry with me for finding out her secret. Envious because I got better grades than her, and jealous because I was closer to Ben than she was. Mary admitted she felt outshined and left out. So, you decided to expose your own secret you kept for so long just to frame me? Do you hate me that much? No, no, Sandra, it's not like that. I'm really sorry. As for that secret, I had tried to act like a hot girl from a rich family just to be worthy of that jerk, Louis. But since I know he's a bad guy, there's no point of keeping that secret anyway. Ben and I leaned over and hugged her, saying it was all okay. As long as we are honest from now on, we'd be able to sort everything out. After that, we helped Mary clean up the messy tables in the cafeteria. And can you believe it? The lunch lady is actually Mary's mother. She was the one who unintentionally told Mary all the petty secrets that everyone gossiped about while getting lunch. Mary has always hidden the fact her mom's the lunch lady, but after being exposed and boycotted, she gave up and decided not to try hard for the popular girl title anymore, but just to be herself. I knew that this was hard for Mary, but deep down, she has a good heart, else she wouldn't have befriended me when I first started at this school. Living up to the expectations of being the school's it girl must have been exhausting. It's been a semester full of drama, hasn't it? Phew, lucky it's almost over. Now we're in a hurry to revise all lessons together to prepare finals week. We still compete with each other a lot, but this time it's fair and square. The three of us already decided that whoever gets the lowest score will have to take the other two out for dinner. Free food, here I come, as I definitely am not going to lose. <laughs>
On the journey home, I sat there sulking. Drew had majorly annoyed me. How dare he stand me up? Sensing my mood, Mom asked, Sweetie, what's up? Aren't you happy to be back? I muttered out, Yeah, I just don't appreciate Drew not picking me up. Mom casually said, Oh, right. Although, I suppose planning the wedding is keeping him busy. I'm sure he just forgot. I sat upright in my seat. What? Wedding? Whose wedding? My mom then acted surprised. He didn't tell you? Oh, how busy the groom-to-be must be. <laughs> Honey, it's Drew's wedding. This uneasy feeling washed over me. I felt like I'd been cheated on. Okay, so I didn't love him. But that's not the point. How dare some girl come along and steal him away from me? I arrived home to see Drew pacing the curb. He spotted me and gave me an excited wave. I stormed over to him and shouted out, Why didn't you tell me you're getting married? He smiled and then replied, I'm sorry, Amy. I just wanted to do it in person as I have an important question to ask you. He sounded so serious. Then he reached into his pocket. OMG, was he going to propose to me? Has this all been a prank leading to this moment? But no, he pulled out a packet of mints and offered me one. At that moment, a girl walked out of his house and passed him a coffee. He wrapped his arms around her waist and kissed the top of her head. Yuck! Amy, you remember Emily, right? She was in your year at school. She's my fiancé. We'd like to ask you to be our bridesmaid. Emily added, Actually, he wanted you to be his best man, since we all know how close you guys are, but that would look a little strange, don't you think? I just stood there speechless with my mouth wide open. No, I didn't remember this Emily girl from school, and I didn't want to be her stupid bridesmaid. Drew joked, Aren't you happy for me? I know you'll love this. That's why I waited till now to tell you, to be able to see your over-the-top reaction. <laughs> I had no reaction. I literally couldn't find any words to say and just stood there motionless as the realization that the guy I could always count on was now someone else's, and I was meant to help them out with their lame wedding. I tried being happy for them, but they just made me feel so sick. Now whenever I wanted to see Drew, there's Emily tagging along, and they always talk to each other in this annoying high-pitched voice, not to mention the kissing and hugging every five seconds. I couldn't stand seeing their PDA for another moment, so I decided to pull some mischievous pranks. First, I kept asking Emily to eat fast foods with me, which I told her that I extremely craved for since I'd been abroad for so long. But the real reason was just that I wanted her to gain weight quickly and be unable to fit into her wedding dress. And I succeeded. When the three of us visited the wedding shop, whichever dress that Emily liked to try, she couldn't fit in. So the only one that fitted her looked very old-fashioned and ugly. Seeing her sulky face, I was so happy inside. Until Drew ran towards her and comforted her, he praised her as the most beautiful woman in the world, no matter what she wore. And he was very lucky to marry her. Ugh. I want to puke for real. A few days later, Emily held her bachelorette party. As the party venue was close to my house, Emily and her friends decided to come over to prepare themselves before the party. Though I found it bothersome at first, then I realized that it's a good opportunity for another prank. That afternoon, when they were all busy putting on makeup and getting dressed, I offered to help Emily iron her dress as I was ironing mine. She agreed and handed me the dress. I secretly turned up the iron's temperature, and it burnt her silk dress in a blink. I screamed and acted like it was an accident. Emily and her friends immediately rushed over. They were shocked to see the dress was totally ruined. I apologized frantically as tears started to well up in Emily's eyes. Are you sure you didn't do it on purpose? A friend of Emily asked me. Then everyone gave me a dirty look. No, don't say that. Amy's just trying to help me, Emily said through tears. Geez, why did she have to be so nice? After that, she called Drew, cried desperately, and told him everything. And just half an hour later, Drew showed up and handed Emily a brand new dress, which is even prettier than the old one. Emily hugged Drew, kissed him on the cheek, and went on and on about how he's the best. Yuck. Suddenly, some of Emily's friends whispered something like, Emily is so lucky to have a fiancé like Drew. Unlike Carl, he is really useless. So Carl was Emily's ex, right? I wondered if he also wanted to break this wedding like me. 
so I did some digging online and easily found Carl. Then I messaged him, telling him I was Emily's bridesmaid and I had something super urgent to tell him about her. He agreed to meet me at a bar downtown. First impression? This guy's actually kinda cute. Turns out, goody two-shoes Emily has good taste in guys. As I sat down next to him, I noticed that Carl had been drinking a lot, but I didn't think much of it at the time. I gave my best convincing look and told him, Emily still has feelings for you. She's now having cold feet about the wedding. At first, he didn't say much. He just kept on drinking. But suddenly, he stood up and slurred out how he needed to confess his love to her. Right now! So I followed him to her house. That night, the bridesmaids were having a sleepover at Emily's to help her prepare the guest list for the wedding and stuff. I quickly came in and made up some excuse for showing up late. And that's when we all heard something noisy coming from outside. Everyone ran to the porch to check out Carl begin to drunkenly slur out something like, I will always love you and such. Emily looked shocked and tried persuading Carl to go home. I watched on with a secret smirk as he threw up in her pot plant, accused the other bridesmaids of being traitors, and tripped over the cat as he tried to enter her house. Carl eventually passed out on the couch, and Emily, being Emily, placed a blanket over him. She didn't even look angry. Why? I couldn't understand why I had done so many things, but she could be so calm and overcame everything. The next day, when Carl woke up, they talked, and I was terrified Carl would tell Emily about my involvement. But instead, he apologized to her, wished her the best for the future, then left. A few days later, Carl asked me to meet him at a coffee shop. He asked me why I lied to him, as Emily said she was very blissful to marry Drew. I sighed and told him the truth. I also said that I didn't have feelings for Drew, I just hated to see the two of them together. Then Carl said, Don't let jealousy get the best of you. Listen to me, Amy. What we need to do now is restore our life and leave the past behind. I felt down upon hearing his words, but I knew Carl was right. Despite Drew having been my best friend since childhood, it was the moment he needed to have a life of his own. Don't be so sad, Carl said, patting my hand gently. I looked up and was fascinated by not only Carl's look, but also his maturity and sensitivity. The wedding day came. I stood next to Drew and Emily as they exchanged their rings to take a vow to be husband and wife. Somehow, I felt so proud that my best friend found his life partner. But still, I felt a little uneasy inside, until I spotted Carl in the crowd. He walked over, gave me a bright smile, and joked that he was going to spend the rest of the day here so I couldn't cause any more havoc. I laughed out loud and responded, It was more about him than me that would be causing trouble in the wedding. After the ceremony, we spent time together walking through the park and went to an arcade. I have to admit that it was kind of fun and took my mind off things. Since then, something weird happened. I have found myself thinking about Carl a lot. Like, a lot. Am I developing feelings for him? Maybe now is the time for me to find my life partner too. And I think I've found a great candidate. Hi, I'm Stella, and I had a boyfriend called Cole. Emphasis on the had. You see, I really liked Cole, but he expected me to do everything for him. But he didn't show me the same respect. I always put him first. One time, I bailed on my friends to see him. Then he canceled on me last minute to watch a baseball match with his brother. But... I was mad, so I ended up venting out my problems to one of my guy friends. Then I kissed him. I instantly regretted it. Cole found out, and he broke up with me. Then the next day, he started dating this annoying sophomore girl. Like, seriously, couldn't he stick to a girl his own age, as he was a senior? How dare Cole break up with me? Yes, I made a mistake, but only because he let me down. I'd made one lame mistake. But other than that, I tried my hardest to be an awesome girlfriend to him. He was clearly waiting for me to mess up so he could break up with me for her. The anger toward Cole was eating me up. Revenging him was all I could think about. One day at lunch, my best friend Sophia's boyfriend Branson told me about this spiritualist his mom saw. Apparently, she cast a spell to help her get over her boyfriend leaving her. I wasn't really into the spiritual stuff and such, but I guessed it was worth a try. 
So after school, Branson took me to see her. She lived up in this creepy alley. It was eerily quiet, yet it felt like I was being watched. I gave him this you-must-be-kidding look, but he grabbed my arm and pulled me forward. A middle-aged woman answered the door. Her dark hair was so long, it almost reached her hips, and she was wearing this flowy dress. I'm still... I started. Yes, I know. She waved me forward. Come in, come in. Branson waited outside, and I gave him a this-is-weird look before I followed this woman inside. She led me into a small room full of crystals, glass balls, and jars full of different things such as spices, colored ribbons, and flowers. So, you, um, make spells? I asked her. Yes, I do, she smiled at me. But beware, magic is a powerful thing that doesn't always work the way intended. Um... I want a spell to make my ex Cole break up with his girlfriend and want me back. She asked for my hair. I mean, just a single hair, not all of it. I pulled out three strands of my hair and gave it to her, feeling so confused. Then she asked for Cole's stuff. I shook my head tentatively. Then I remembered that I had one of his earphones in my backpack. This must be really serious. She asked me again if I was sure, and I gave a nod of my head. Like, seriously, didn't this woman want to make money? Then she used my hair to wrap around and around Cole's earphone, then closed her eyes and began chanting words that I couldn't quite make out. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. What was going on? I was so relieved to leave her house, and I told Branson to never ever give me any of his bright ideas again. Now I was down $100 and had been totally freaked out. Over the next few days, I didn't give the spell much thought. I got over Cole and what he did to me. Things were good, but then something crazy happened. At 9 p.m. on a rainy Friday night, there was a knock at my door. My parents were out, so I answered it. Cole was standing on my doorstep, a soggy mess. He actually got down on his knees and begged me to take him back. It was crazy. I told him to go away and slammed the door shut on him. He continued to knock and shouted that he loved me and wanted me back. He'd ended things with his girlfriend as she didn't own his heart. I did. Okay, it was weird. This guy may have looked like Cole, but he certainly wasn't acting like him. He eventually left, but the next morning, he was back again, sobbing out how he couldn't live without me in his life. He didn't seem normal. He was out of his mind. It got so bad that my dad threatened to call the police unless he left right away. Eventually, he did leave, but on Monday morning, he was waiting for me by my locker with a cuddly bear and a box of chocolates. The other kids were laughing as they walked past, and I found myself laughing too. Go away, Cole. I don't like you, and I never will. You're a loser, I told him. He looked like he was going to cry. I have to admit that seeing him this distressed felt good. But a week later, his weird behavior continued. He was still following me around and buying me gifts. This had gone too far, and I needed to do something about it. So I opened up to Branson about it. He told me not to worry and said he'd visit the spiritualist and get her to undo the spell. I guess it worked as Cole finally seemed to get the message and his behavior mellowed down. But then something weird began to happen to me. I had a dream about getting with Branson and now I can't stop thinking about him. On a few occasions, I've walked over to his house at night in a trance-like state. It's taken all my will not to knock on his door. Seeing Sophia all loved up with him makes me want to puke. I never had feelings for Branson before. What if he cast a spell on me to make me fall for him? I went back to the old alley to find the spiritualist woman, but I couldn't find the house. It's like the house and the spiritualist woman have never existed. Okay, so something else weird happened too. I was in the park one day, and I was sure I saw Branson talking to Cole. They looked really chatty. They weren't friends, so what was going on? 
I can't go straight to my best friend's boyfriend to ask shameful questions like, did you put a love spell on me? Or did you set up this whole thing with Cole to make me fall for you? I don't know what's going on. All I know is, as ridiculous as this may sound, I have this desire to be around Branson all the time. I've had crushes on boys before, but never like this. I don't know what's happening or what I should do next. Hey, I'm Jody. I'm a freshman at high school. High school life is hard and stressful, isn't it? But I'm so lucky to be a part of the perfect three with Harmony and Callie. As great as being friends with them is, it can also be challenging, especially as I'm not as life sure as they are. In comparison to them, I felt so boring and dull. But then something crazy happened. All I can say is I never expected boys to ruin our solid relationship. I wasn't brave with this crazy independent streak like Harmony. Her plan after high school is to go backpacking in Thailand, alone. Callie's strong-minded, quirky, and confident. She is leading a drama club at our school. Yes, she is the kind of person who never thinks twice about clashing colors or wearing three bunches in her hair. I wasn't like them. Instead, I was quiet. My shyness meant that I never told Logan that I had a crush on him. Logan's a genuine boy from school kind of guy. He's handsome, funny, smart, and sporty. Obviously, he would never like a loser like me. So I just had to find a good way to deal with my emotions myself. I sealed my feelings for him away in a love letter. And of course, he was never meant to see it. I tried to avoid Logan as much as I could, but just a month later, I realized that Harmony also likes him. She was not afraid to tell the world and confessed her feelings to him, which was what I would never dare to do. She always gave things up for me and protected me no matter what. So the only thing I could do for her was take a step back. So I wrote my final secret love letter to Logan, saying, From your floppy hair phase to the way you wrinkle up your nose when you sneeze, I've always loved you, Logan. Always. I love you more than Harmony ever has, nor ever will. I don't want you to think I'm a horrible person. I love my friend Harmony, and I want her to be happy. And if that's with Logan, then so be it. I just needed to write him a final love letter to deal with my feelings towards him. But then, I sealed the letter and placed it deep inside my desk drawer to make sure my feelings were safe. Soon, Harmony and Logan started to date. And watching them together made my heart ache. But I'm a quiet girl, so it's not hard to pretend to bless them and hide my true feelings. But something even more disastrous happened. One time, we were on a school camping trip, and Logan was sitting with us in our tent. It was such an awkward moment when Callie was away FaceTiming a guy on her phone, therefore leaving just me there with Logan and Harmony. Talk about feeling like a third wheel! Ages of silence went by, and I had to make an excuse to go out. I couldn't even meet his eyes. Bad idea! It was nothing but dark and cold out there, and I was alone wishing Callie would come back soon. But suddenly, I felt a strong hand grab my arm and pull me back. It was Logan! What was he doing here? Logan? Oh, you're going back to your camping tent? I mumbled. Yeah, Jody, I just don't want to be alone with Harmony. It was so awkward. Oh, you guys are old enough to be in that situation. Don't be shy. I tried to blurt out a random joke and wink at him. No. I like you, and I always have. I just didn't think you liked me. You weren't exactly easy to read. I got your letters. He leaned in to kiss me. For a moment, I thought this was wonderful, but I was disillusioned and quickly pushed him away. I couldn't do that to Harmony. When we came back home the following morning, I rushed to my room to find my drawer empty. Someone found and stole them and sent them to Logan. I couldn't think of anything else. I was too afraid that if Harmony knew about this, our friendship would end. Unfortunately, my rejection wasn't enough to stop Logan. In the following days, he kept on jumping out at me at school, in the canteen, in my living room, and tried to convince me that our feelings weren't wrong. He got so intense that in the end, I blurted out to him that I was dating Robbie, one of my classmates. 
Luckily, Robbie had recently split up with his girlfriend, so he agreed to be my pretend boyfriend to keep Logan off the scent and to make his ex jealous. Having Robbie on hand was great. He came up with a genius plan for me to tell Logan that the love letters were purely some of many I'd written for my English assignment. And the truth is, Robbie's my real life boyfriend. Logan didn't believe it until Robbie led me to the basketball match where Logan was playing. It was awkward, as Harmony was there cheering him on, and she seemed oblivious to the fact he wouldn't stop staring at me. When Robbie grabbed my hand and kissed my cheek, Logan missed the basket, and the ball flew into the crowd. Logan quit pestering me after that, but he's still dating Harmony. I feel bad about it, but I'm hoping that Harmony will figure out for herself what Logan's actually like. If I tell her the truth, I worry she'll take his side, not mine, as love has a habit of blurring people's reality. To keep up the act, Robbie posted a picture of us both on his Facebook, and he sent me a relationship request. Although I knew that it was just a move to annoy his ex-girlfriend, I found myself feeling happy about this. The moment after I clicked accept on the request, Kelly rushed over to my house and angrily said, How could you do this to me? Robbie's mine! Why do you have to steal both of your best friend's guys? I replied, it's fake. We faked it just to make his ex-girlfriend jealous. And I have no idea you have a crush on him. And what do you mean, both? Don't act like a naive girl. I saw your letters. You're such a dirty fake girl. You don't deserve our friendship or anyone's love. She yelled at me and I was completely shocked. So Callie was the one who stole my letters and sent them to Logan. It was my secret to keep, not hers. I was so mad that she could do that to me. So, okay, she found the letters, but she could have spoken to me about them first, not just gone behind my back and sent them to him. She screamed at me that I was a horrible fake friend and that she thought that Logan deserved to know how fake I was in developing feelings for my best friend's boyfriend. She left and now I'm stuck in a big mess. I never asked for any of this. All I want is a quiet life with my best friends. I don't know how I meant to get out of this situation without both of my friends hating me. I'm standing in the middle of the room wearing this extravagant dress and a glittery mask. All eyes are on me, but I can sense how ingenuine they are. This is supposed to be my sweet 16th, and yet all of these guests were complete strangers. Ugh, it's all that slimeball Gregory's fault. Actually, this OTT party was all down to him. Oh, hi, I'm Vivian, but my friends call me Viv. My mom, Jacqueline Mars, is one of the wealthiest people on Earth. So I grew up thinking massive mansions, gigantic pools, and a floor entirely for toys was the norm. Well, at least I did until I turned 10. That day I was playing in my life-size dollhouse when I heard talking coming from the other side of the fence. I peeked over it and saw a woman and a girl around my age who looked kind of weird. Curious, I spoke up. Hey you, why do you dress so funny? Pardon? What did you say? You don't even have shoes on. That's so silly. You're the silly one. Bet you've never tasted this before, huh? So try it. Spoiled rich kids like you always look down on others. While in fact, you're no use to society. I just stood there dumbfounded as the security shooed them away. I never meant to offend her, I I was just curious. So I rushed inside the house to find mom and ask her about this. Oh honey, not anyone can be as wealthy as we are. That means you don't have to worry about a thing, sweet pea. Now go play so mommy can work, okay? Even to this day, mom's words still linger in my ears. I've grown to resent my family's wealth. I just wanted to be a normal kid. That's why, by the time I got to middle school, I convinced mom to let me transfer from my private school to a public one and wipe out everything about me online, so no one would know about my influential family. I get the bus to school, buy clothes from thrift shops, and prepare my own lunch instead of bringing the gourmet dish the chefs make for me. A perfect normal life. Until Gregory, mom's so-called boyfriend, showed up. He sticks his big nose in everything. Thanks to him, mom wouldn't stop nagging at me about my clothing, my trashy public school, or how I gotta stop hanging out with the mediocre kids. Ugh, he is driving me insane. And to top it off, he gave mom the idea of throwing me a 16th birthday party. I hate attention, mom knows this, but what Gregory wants, Gregory gets. 
This could be an opportunity to introduce her to society and gain new associates. It'd be good for her when she takes over business in the future, blah blah blah. Poof. Please. The only thing that man cares about is himself and his associates, not mine. In the end, I agreed to a masquerade ball, on one condition. Mom has to stop interfering with who I should or shouldn't hang out with, especially my friends at school. And that brings us to the present. Right when the host announces that it's time for… my first dance? Huh? My what now? Ugh. Gregory! I was confusedly looking around to find a partner, when suddenly a hand grabbed me. Birthday girl, come dance with me. Ugh, what a creep. Let go! Can somebody help me with this? Suddenly a boy around my age appeared. Oh my. He has the most beautiful grey eyes I've ever seen. Excuse me, sir. I believe the lady has agreed to have her first dance with me. Thank you, handsome stranger. As we danced, I couldn't help but stare dreamily into those gorgeous eyes of his. We were about to leave the dance floor when he whispered in my ear, Wait here. I'll be right back. <sighs> Who would have thought a superficial party like this would lead me to my perfect guy? Suddenly, I heard a snapping sound behind me, and as I turned around, my mask fell off. Oh no, a paparazzi cut my mask string. I tried to cover my face with my hands, but it was no use. Luckily, Mum rushed over and hid me behind her. Sorry everyone, but the party's over. We had a great time and hope to see you all again soon. Then she led me back to my room, while the security showed everyone the way out. From that moment on, my ordinary life ended for good. My face was plastered all over the internet as the billionaire Jacqueline Mars' daughter. Now everyone at school is looking at me funny. I don't get it, guys. I'm still the same old Viv. Oh, there my besties are. They would surely have my back, right? But nope. As I approached them, they went ballistic on me, saying how I don't trust them enough to confess about my actual background, so from now on we're no longer friends. This is so unfair. I never asked for any of this. I wipe away my tears, trying to act like nothing happened. Huh? What's this? There's a note lying on top of my books that says, Hey, it's me, the guy from your birthday party. I'm so sorry for what happened to you. If you need anyone to talk to, text me anytime. Oh, so he's from our school? Wow, just when I thought no one's there for me, he showed up again. But there's no name though. Is he still playing this mysterious game? Okay, I'll just call him my masked knight then. From that day on, we texted non-stop. He just gets me. My family situation, my friends, everything. One time, he even secretly slid a Blackpink concert ticket in my bag, since I once told him that I was their diehard fan. Another time, he sent me a gift card to my all-time favorite ice cream store, Ben & Jerry's, just to cheer me up on a bad day. Aww. This ice cream tastes delicious, but I can't help wishing the Masked Knight was here with me. All I know is he has the most beautiful grey eyes and gorgeous black hair. Hmm. Oh, speak of the devil. Hey, I have a surprise for you this Valentine's Day. Hope you're as excited to see me as I am to see you. Finally, I get to meet the boy I'm crazy about. I can't wait. On Valentine's Day, I was in English staring out of the window and thinking about my masked knight. I wonder what he looks like. Ladies, I brought your Valentine's roses. Here you go, Viv. This is it. It's gotta be from him. Happy Valentine's Day. Have a taste of the rose, then come meet me at the pool. X. I quickly unwrapped the candy, popped it into my mouth, then rushed to meet my dream man. Well, where was he? As I tried calling him, the room started to spin. I saw the outline of a blurred black figure, then... Ugh... My head is killing me. Where am I? And whose hand am I holding? Hold on. Those eyes. He must be. Thank goodness you're awake. Uh, are you the one who danced with you at your birthday party? In the flesh. I'm Jeremiah, by the way. I had higher hopes for our first face-to-face -face meeting, but oh well. <laughs> Turns out, he always knew I went to the same school as him. 
but he was a bit intimidated by my family's influence, so he decided to get to know me via text first. He said the cops had found some sort of sleep-inducing substance in my rose candy. Before I could quiz him anymore on this, Mom barged into the room and hugged me. After making sure I was okay, she turned to Jeremiah and said, You saved my daughter. For that, I can never thank you enough. Please join us for dinner tomorrow night. Jeremiah seemed hesitant at first, but then he nodded in agreement. Hmm. The dinner did not go as planned. Between Mom's blatant interrogating and Gregory's menacing looks, I could sense Jeremiah's discomfort. Then when Jeremiah asked where the restroom was, Gregory insisted on showing him. When Jeremiah returned, he seemed flustered and made his excuses to leave. Gah. What had that annoying Gregory said to him? I quickly followed Jeremiah and apologized, but he just smiled and offered to pick me up for school tomorrow. The cops haven't found the culprit yet, so from now on, I'll be your guardian. How sweet. After that, I hung out with him every day. Great, right? Only, somehow it didn't feel the same as when we were texting. Back then we had a deep connection. Now it was just like two friends hanging out. Oh, and not to mention Olivia, Jer's childhood friend who can't seem to leave him alone for more than two seconds. One time, Jer and I were at the movies together, but guess who coincidentally appeared and plonked herself down next to him? Yep, Olivia. Worse still, with their giggling and popcorn sharing, I felt like the third wheel. I was not having this again, so I just left for home in this random cab parked outside the theater. But bad luck. The driver doesn't know the way. He doesn't even have a phone. And I had to lend him mine for GPS. The guy snatched it out of my hand immediately. Rude. But wait, it was 9 p.m. already. Why did he still have shades on? And even wore a mask? Right then, I realized the car had passed the town's border. Stop! The car suddenly filled with smoke. And the last thing I thought was, he has eyes that were exactly like... Jairs. I woke up finding myself in this old, cobwebby room. Where is this place? And that driver guy? I have to get out of here now. <clears throat> right at that moment, he came into the room with a smile. Don't you recognize me? Will you have another dance with me? Because I'd love that. What is happening right now? What he just said? Did that mean... He's the actual masked knight? Maybe that's why I don't feel connected to Jeremiah. Why did Jer lie to me then? So many questions popped up in my head. Then suddenly I heard a car stop outside. That guy immediately went to check. This could be my chance of escaping. By the time I got downstairs, I saw the driver guy talking to... Jeremiah. So I hid behind the door and watched on. Cameron, just stop this. Getting revenge on our father is one thing. But this is a step too far. Take Viv back to her family now and end this. I know this looks bad, but trust me, I'd never hurt Viv. I didn't mean for her to fall into the pool. That's why I jumped in to save her. But I need her as bait to show the world what that jerk Gregory is like. He doesn't deserve to be her father. <gasps> I muzzled myself in shock. Gregory is their father? And that Cameron guy was the one saving me, not Jer? Don't you forget who abandoned us when Mom had a close brush with death, then took all our business and properties, even our home, leaving us helpless? That jerk deserves all he gets. I was trying to process it all, when another car arrived. Gregory's. I quickly hid under the stairs before he walked in with a bunch of bodyguards. Cameron, Jeremiah, my sons, haven't you grown up so fast? Cut to the chase. Give us back the business, and what's rightfully ours. Then we'll let your stepdaughter go. Huh, <laughs> indeed. Like father, like sons. Very smart. But still amateurs, my boys. You see, all that girl is to me is an obstacle blocking my way to the inheritance. So please, be my guest and take care of that little Miss Annoying. Aren't you afraid we'll expose everything you just said? And who's gonna believe you now? Jacqueline is mesmerized by me. So she'd believe anything I say. <laughs> that snake. How dare he speak of my mom like that? Unable to hold in my rage, I jumped out of my hiding spot and screamed at Gregory. What did you say about my mom? 
You slimy, lying traitor. Nice talking to you all, but the fun has to end here. Goodbye. The guards lunged forward, about to tie me up when… The cops smashed the door coming in, and behind them was… Mom! Stop right there. How dare you do this to my daughter! Gregory's face turned paler than a ghost as he mumbled out, Jackie, honey, why you're here? Um, but just in time to save our baby, Vivian. Cut the act. I already heard everything you said. And you're going to jail for a long time. Then the cops led him and took his crook guards away. Seeing Mum, I was so happy I rushed to hug her. Turns out, her investigations of the pool incident led her to Cameron. So when she confronted him, he eventually told her everything. That's how they came up with a plan to catch Gregory red-handed. Mum and the cops had been waiting in ambush around here for Gregory to show up. Then, well, you know the rest. A lot has happened in three months. Mum finally finished all the legal stuff, so now the property Gregory had merged with hers to gain her trust is now signed back over to Cam and Jeremiah. I realized that being wealthy isn't a bad thing, especially as it means with influence like this, I can help other less fortunate people and really make a difference. Now I help mum with her business and her charity work, and I'm really enjoying it. I'm proud of my hard-working, amazing mum, and I'm proud of who I am. And guess what? I now have real friends who like me for me. As for Jeremiah, well, he apologized about everything. He used to fear his brother was going to hurt me, so he lied to protect me. We made up, of course, and became the best of friends. I'm not sure I can say the same about his brother, though. He did everything he could to beg for my forgiveness, but I just… can't. Then one day, Jer asked me to come by his home to visit his mom. She begged me not to think badly of her boys, especially Cameron. He's in love with you, you know? He always talks about you, and how he wishes things would have been different. Oh boy, her words are starting to have an effect on me. When I walked out the door, I saw Cameron sitting on the porch. He turned and looked at me, and I felt my heart pound for my grey-eyed, masked night. So, taking a deep breath, I walked over to him, just as the sun was setting.